mobility, exchanges between artists, and joint grant projects. To date, we have awarded nearly 6,000 scholarships, residencies, and grant projects. International Visegrad Fund, Central Europe, granted. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome all of you who decided to be with us to join us for this conference day. I would like to welcome speakers, participants, viewers on the University of Łódź streaming media, and last but not least, interpreters and our technical team. This conference is organized by the University of Łódź with cooperation, with support uh, of Charles University of Prague, University of Maribor, Trnava University in Trnava, University of Tours, and Karoli Gaspa University of the Reformed Church in Hungary, namely uh, our partner organization within the Whistle Pro grant. Because the conference is held within the Whistle Pro Whistle Pro Grant, the Visegrad Grant, uh, with uh, the title Workplace Whistleblower Protection in the Visegrad Countries, France and Slovenia, and is financed by the governments of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Poland through Visegrad grants uh, from the International Visegrad Fund. The aim of our project uh, is to develop a model, a legislative model for the improvement of protection for the effective protection, we hope, of whistleblowers in all the Visegrad countries with the support, with inspiration coming from Slovenia and France. And these efforts uh, are taken uh, within the context of uh, implementation of the European Union whistleblowing directive, uh, which is to take part uh, in December uh, next uh, year at, uh, at the latest. So uh, we hope that uh, it will be an inspiring day full of uh, discussions of dialogue before starting, uh, I would like to transmit to you some information which may be useful for the smooth uh, continuation of your participation here. So I kindly ask uh, all of you to check if you have the interpretation function at your Zoom platform. If you do not see the function interpretations, means that probably you did not load the newest version of a platform Zoom, so you are kindly asked to do this. We are interpreted simultaneously into Czech, Polish, Slovakian, and Hungarian languages. The conference is streamed uh, to the YouTube and Facebook of the University of Łódź and for the linguistic coherence, all the speakers will be speaking in English. And you are also kindly asked to put any questions or comments that you have to a given speaker through the questions and uh, answers function uh, in English or in the language understandable for the given speaker. So please kindly indicate in questions that you address your question to a given speaker. In the first session, it will be uh, either French for Professor uh, Gwenola Bargain uh, or Slovenian for Professor Daria Senčur Pecek and uh, Mrs. Maja Czarny Pretnar. Mm, the time for asking questions uh, lasts uh, till the end of the session so that we are ready and prepared already for the discussion part. If you would like to uh, take a position, present a short comment during the discussion, please kindly signal it to us now during the session. Your short comment uh, should be either in English or in one of Visegrad group languages. 
So uh, my, uh, my kind request is now for all the participants to mute the cameras and microphones. The conference is being registered and streamed now. And I would like uh, to start the first session, which I have the honor and pleasure to preside. So I see uh, already the speakers. I would like to greet in order of uh, appearance, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Gwenola Bargain from University of Tours. Bonjour. Could you unmute your microphone now? Dzień dobry. <laughs> Dzień dobry. Mm -hmm. Professor Daria Sanchur Pecek, is everything all right? Yes, hello. Yes, hello. And Miss, from University of Maribor, and Mrs. Maya Czarny Pretnar, representative of the Ministry of Justice of the um, Slovenian Republic. Um, yes, hello. Good morning. Hello. Uh, happily, we do not have any technical problems with uh, speakers. So um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. We are very fortunate to have Professor Gwenola Barga with us. Professor is a uh, director of the Master of Employment Law at the University of uh, Tours. She specializes in private law and labor law. Her research is concerned especially uh, with the relationship between labor law and economics. And I may also add, if I may, that professor also teaches at the School of French Law at the University of Wood, so we are also happy for this uh, type of cooperation. Now, uh, then, we are looking forward to listening to your presentation uh, on the French legislation concerning uh, whistleblowing. Please share, uh, share, share the screen with us. Thank you very much, dear Dagmara, and um, I will try to share the presentation with you. Um, so, is that okay for you? Yes, 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 it's visible. Okay, perfect. So, I'm really pleased to, to take part to this uh, great project and thank you very much, dear Dagmara, for inviting me in this uh, project. So um, I will try to explain the legal framework in France about the protection of whistleblower. Um, but first, sorry for my accent on my English because it's quite approximative, but uh, I hope you will understand what I will try to explain. So. Um, you may know that in France, uh, it has been almost uh, four years since the so-called Loi Sapin 2, Law Sapin 2, uh, established a legal regime to guarantee the protection of whistleblowers. So we have a law, an act, and we have also a decree dated April 2017, um, which has specified the procedure for collecting alerts. So we have a law and a decree, but litigation remains very rare for the moment. And the expression of whistleblower is not very often used by judges. And we have a famous case in France, but this case concerns not an employee, but a labor inspector. So the French concept of whistleblower is still in its infancy. We have in France a Defender of Rights, and the Defender of Rights is an organization in charge of the guidance and protection of whistleblowers. And this Defender of Rights um, underline a relatively low number of alerts reporting since the adoption of the law. So we will try to uh, understand why um, we have a low number of alerts in France. It should be remembered in this regard that the French approach is in line with the protection of freedom of expression. So I can quote the Defender of Rights, the alert is first and foremost the manifestation of a fundamental individual freedom, the freedom of expression. And it is in this sense that the Supreme Court, the Cour de Cassation, 
conceived the protection of whistleblower. Before the adoption of the Law Sapin II, the Cour de Cassation had recognized this protection for employees denouncing acts deemed irregular. So now we have the text, we have the Law Sapin II, but it is relatively recent and people are relatively uninformed. And the assessment of this legislation um, is quite difficult to draw up, given its precocity. Given the adoption of the European Directive, we have currently two recent private members' bills, uh, which have been submitted in the National Assembly. So we have a discussion about the evolution of the French legal framework. So first, I will try to uh, present this framework, and then I will try to confront uh, this framework to its limits. So the general purpose of the legal framework relating to whistleblowers in France is above all to guarantee protection against possible retaliation. So we have two uh, main pillars of this protection, which are the, confidenti the confidentiality of the report and the criminal responsibility in case of violation of a secret protected by law. So if you look at the Article 6 of the law, you can see that we do not have exactly a definition of the alert. We have a legal qualification of the alert. And it is a matter of revealing or reporting a crime or an offense, a serious and manifest violation of an international commitment, a serious and manifest violation of a unilateral act of an international organization, or a serious and manifest violation of a law or regulation, or a serious threat or prejudice to the general interest. So it is not a definition. It's not really a catalog or a list because you can see that it's very um, vague. Um, what is important, the main criterion, is the seriousness of the breach, the seriousness of the violation. Um, it must be a serious violation. It must be a serious harm or serious threat, and this seriousness is not specified. So it will be assessed in the light of the general interest, for example. For a crime or an offense, you have the penal qualification, but for a serious threat, it will be the person who issues the alert, who must assess the seriousness of the breach he or she wishes to report. So the material scope of protection in France is very wide. For the personal scope of protection, uh, it refers to any natural person. So it could be uh, an employee, but uh, as well um, um, a self-employed worker or a temporary worker. Um, Work-related context is not required. So we have a very a large formulation, but uh, you can see that uh, legal entities or legal uh, persons uh, cannot benefit from such protection. What is a very restrictive convention is that the whistleblower must have a personal knowledge of the violation. And this is a very important condition. It implies that the person has access to information and it does not allow for the protection of third parties, for instance, people who provide assistance to the whistleblower. Um, because you must have a personal knowledge uh, of the facts you are um, disclosing. So you can see that um, in comparison with the directive, it's not exactly the same because the directive states that measures for the protection of reporting persons shall apply to facilitators, 
third persons who are connected with the reporting persons or legal entities that the reporting persons own, work for, or are connected with in a work-related context. So we have a difference, which is, to my opinion, really important. You have an, another condition, um, and it is, a, to my view, a restrictive condition. It is that a whistleblower must act in a disinterested manner and in good faith. The condition of being uh, disinterested is not always quite understood. It may be, it may imply the absence of material fin financial interest inactive. But it can be more broadly understood as implying the absence of any personal involvement in the facts reported. So it could lead to a considerable reduction in the scope of the protection granted. And again, this condition is not clearly specified by the directive. You have this considerant 32, uh, which provides that reporting persons should be entitled to protection if they have reasonable grounds to believe that the information reported falls within its scopes. But the considerant 32 um, provides that the motives of the reporting persons in reporting should be irrelevant in deciding whether they should receive protection. So maybe we could have a, a, a difficulty with this condition of being um, selfless or disinterested. Now in France, you have a very uh, strict uh, procedure to um, follow. Uh, the French procedure implies the respect of the gradation in the reporting channels. It favors internal reporting. The whistleblower must bring the facts to the attention of the direct or indirect superior, the employer or a referent nominated by the employer. For companies with at least 50 employees, uh, companies are required to establish an internal procedure for collecting alerts. So in the absence of processing, uh, then the report may be sent to an authority, a judicial or administrative authority, or to professional orders. And as a last resort, um, in the absence of processing, then the report may be made public. You have one exception. It's that in cases of serious and imminent danger or risk of irreversible damage, the alert can be public. Uh, but it is an exception. And if you want to be protected by the law, you have to follow these three steps. Then the protection in France is mainly a criminal irresponsibility and a protection against retaliation. You have this article um, in the penal code, which provides that uh, the condition, which provides the condition of disclosure. The condition of disclosure is that the disclosure should be necessary and proportionate to safeguard the interest involved. You have as well to follow the reporting procedures. And if the whistleblower meets these conditions, he or she will be irresponsible. But you can see that you can be a whistleblower and the condition for being protected against criminal responsibility is that you have you need a disclosure which is necessary and proportionate so it's not really easy sometimes to know if the disclosure is proportionate and you have quite um, uncertainty with this condition then you have in the labor code um, this um, protection 
against retaliation. Um, the whistleblower um, may not be discriminated against for having reported an alert in compliance of the laws of and two. And so you have um, a very um, vast list of um, uh, acts of retaliation uh, which are prohibited. Then this is a protection. The problem is the limits are you have a lot of protect, protected secrets. Um, Article 1 of the Law Sapin 2 provides that uh, facts, information, or documents covered by national defense secrecy, medical secrecy, or the secrecy of relations between a lawyer and his client are excluded from the alert regime. So this is the first category. But you have as well a special uh, regime for banking secrecy. And you have a um, special regime for trade secrets. Of course, in France, you have an exception uh, which is provided for the disclosure of such a secret in the context of an alert. But this exception is not really clear and the criteria are not quite um, clear currently. Um, to reveal an illegal activity, a fault or reprehensible, uh, reprehensible behavior, um, including the right to alert as defined in Article 6, you can, you can um, breach this trade secret. Um, but, you know, it's very vague. So, we have two, uh, three main points um, of um, discussion about a possible evolution of the legal framework. Um, the first one is the role of legal entities. The reflection aims at extending the personal scope of application to legal persons. Of course, um, this protection cannot be identical to the protection concerning natural persons. Uh, legal entities are not employees or salaried. But they expose themselves to criminal prosecution in the context uh, of a contribution uh, made to a person issuing an alert. So it could be interesting to guarantee um, to legal entities uh, a penal irresponsibility uh, in the same way. Um, the second point is that the material support. And this condition is clearly mentioned by the directive uh, as the directive provides that member states may provide for financial assistance and support measures. Um, but in France, a whistleblower must act in a disinterested way. So maybe this condition could be too restrictive under the legal framework from the directive. And then you have the third point, uh, which is the question of public whistleblowing the priority of internal reporting could prevent the person from revealing an infringement. Because if you have a conflict with your superior, with your organization, um, it's not always easy to uh, follow the procedure. And so maybe uh, it could be better to have no priority between internal reporting or public reporting. So. Um, those three points are currently at the core of the two private members' bill, two propositions de loi, um, which are under discussion before the National Assembly. So we will see if we have an evolution of these three points. So it is what I wanted to uh, explain about the French legal framework. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Professor Bargain. And I would like um, to introduce Professor Daria Centur Petrek. Professor uh, will present us uh, the legislation of the Slovenian Republic. Professor Daria Centur Petrek uh, is a full professor at the University of Maribor, where she also fulfills fulfilled different uh, and very important functions. So she's a vice dean for research and international relations, a head of the labor law department, and she's a renowned international scientist uh, with the experience in inter international conferences, international congresses, an editor of many prestigious Slovenian reviews. So we have a pleasure uh, to, to have you with us and we are looking forward now uh, to your speech. Please kindly share screen with us. And I would also draw your attention that the questions and answers mode has started. Uh, Professor Gwenola Bargain has a first question, and I also encourage you to ask questions to Professor Daria Sanchur Petrek. This is a very comfortable way of, communi of communicating with speakers because speakers may also reply directly on these questions and answers mode. Yes, Professor, Thank we you. are seeing your yes. presentation yes. now. I would like the, the virtual to... floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> I would also, also like to thank Dagmara for inviting me into this project and into this conference. And I would like to uh, present in, briefly present the, the Slovenian regulation on uh, protection of whistleblowers uh, at the moment. Um, there is no special legal act uh, providing the comprehensive uh, protection to, to whistleblowers in Slovenia. Uh, instead, uh, we have provisions uh, uh, in, in several in several acts, uh, directly or indirectly related to the uh, to the uh, whistleblowers, um, specific protection is is given by the Integrity and Prevention of Corruption Act, but only for uh, for for reporting the the corruption, and the other group of specific uh, protection, the uh, the other group of laws giving the specific protection are. Mm, the, is the group of uh, laws in uh, in uh, financial sector, banking act, insurance act, and so on. Um, so for the all other whistleblowers, only labor legislation apply this general labor law protection. But of course, there are certain uh, particular provisions in other legislation. For example, that inspection inspectors cannot reveal the identity of the whistleblower, and so on. Um, beside the legislation, certain larger Slovenian companies has adopted codes of conduct, ethical codes, corporate integrity policies, and uh, adopting the, the obligation to, um, to establish a system of internal reporting. But as I said, this is, this is not the leg legislative uh, regulation. This, those are codes of, of conduct, internal, internal acts. Um, when we are talking about the personal and material scope of protection, special protection uh, from the Integrity and the uh, Prevention of Corruption Act is given to anyone who is in good faith reported, reporting the, the corruption. Uh, but of course, uh, other special protection is given only to employees and civil servants. Um, maybe I will stress a very interesting pro uh, provision in the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Uh, stating that employees and person having a comparable status to an employee should be protected. But in all other cases, only employees and, uh, and civil servants. And as I mentioned before, only, the, uh, only employees reporting corruption or reporting uh, breaches of the provisions of the legal acts in the, in the financial sector. Um, as labor law protection is regards, of course, it is given to employees and uh, civil servants. Uh, and also certain limited protection is given to economically dependent person, to voluntary trainees and to student working on temporary educational work of, of students. Uh, now, if I uh, turn to internal reporting, in Slovenia, the obligation to establish internal channels for reporting violations uh, by law is, is, is by law imposed only on certain employers. 
only in, to banks, financial sector entities, and so on. So uh, only employers who has adopted codes of conduct has adopt, established internal channels. Uh, otherwise, this obligation is uh, imposed only to the to, uh, to the companies in in a uh, uh, financial sector. And uh, the legislation then imposes the requirements for those systems of uh, internal uh, internal reporting. Uh, as a simple method for transmission of reports, the procedure for acceptance, uh, they should report on the findings to the uh, uh, reporting person and so on. And very important uh, protection is given to the to the uh, identity of to the to the uh, identity of the uh, reporting person. This should not be disclosed uh, without the permission of the reporting person. Mm. Besides internal reporting, external reporting is uh, is uh, regulated, but uh, also only in the um, uh, integrity and uh, prevention of uh, corruption act, and in the, the special acts from the financial sector. Um, the, those acts from financial sector uh, basically impose the obligation of supervisory institutions like the Bank of Slovenia, the Insurance Supervisory Agency, the Security Market Agency, and so and, and others, to establish a notific notification system for violations committed uh, at the banks, insurance companies, and so on, and uh, reported from, from employees in those companies to the supervisory institutions. Uh, the rules or the regulation of those, uh, how, how those uh, channels should be should be uh, organized are very similar as in the case of internal uh, reporting systems um, besides this general there is a general regulation regarding the not disclosing the identity of the whistleblowers in case of uh, inspection act uh, or if someone reveals the the wrongdoing to the police and so on so this general protection is also is also given, but just regarding the uh, disclosure of the uh, of the identity of the reporting person. Uh, as the public whistleblowing is concerned, this concept has become the subject of public discussion in Slovenia in the Corona outbreak. My Slovene colleague will know of whom I'm talking about. When a public servant revealed the irregularities in the procurement of safety, safety equipment, uh, masks, and so on, in a TV show, and generally this concept in Slovenia is uh, understood as a public disclosure of uh, unlawful uh, practices uh, or other irregularities detected by the whistleblower in the working environment and disclosed in the public interest. Now, the Slovenian legislation does not answer the question whether a whistleblower should use the internal or external channels first before going into public. Exception is the, um, the Integrity and Prevention of Corruption Act, which states that the provision on possibility to report corruption to the commission has no impact on the reporting person's right to inform the public of corrupt practices. This is the only such exceptions. Well, then the fact is that public disclosure could harm the reputation, honor of individuals, or could interfere with material of, or non-material sphere of, of legal person. There is no specific legal protection of whistleblowers in Slovenian legislation from civil liability and from liability of, for violating the obligation of loyalty to the employer in such cases. There are certain exculpation clauses in criminal code, and there is a specific exculpation clause in the Trade Secret Act. But in general, there is no such uh, protection uh, in regard of, of civil responsibility. So we have an employee who is protected as anyone else by constitutionally guaranteed freedom of expression. And we have some individuals, some, some legal entities who have also other constitutionally protected rights. And uh, when there is a collision of those rights, uh, um, those uh, human rights, the court will have to decide in, in particular case, based on all relevant circumstances, which rights should be given the protection. And uh, maybe I should give uh, an example from the labor uh, case law. On this ground, the labor courts has been dealing with, with uh, 
this question of uh, weightening the, the basic human rights in cases when employ, employees has, the employee has revealed uh, or disclosed a wrongdoing uh, made from, from uh, employer or management of employer, and the employer has terminated his contract of employment, claiming that the employee was, was uh, violating his duty of loyalty to the employer. And in a um, few such cases, Slovenian courts, including Slovenian labor courts, including uh, the Supreme Court of Slovenia, has uh, um, regarded the determination as being disproportionate, disproportionate infringement uh, of employees' freedom of expression. And the courts were following the criteria from the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, the most important, of course, when we are talking about the uh, whistleblowing, are the, are the protective remedies, the protection against uh, retaliation measures. Now, Slovenian regulation does not specify possible retaliatory, retaliatory measures. Uh, for example, in, uh, Integrity and Prevention of Corruption Act just is, is states that uh, the person who were reporting uh, corruption should be protected against all retaliatory measures. Uh, and, but the law does specify that if uh, the, this retaliatory measure causes the damage to to reporting reporting person, then the whistleblower has the right to claim compensation. In this case, in my opinion, very important is the role of commission of uh, preventing the corruption, who who can assist uh, in in this process, uh, to assist to employee in establishing the causal link between the damage and the retaliatory measures. Uh, also important is the reverse burden of proof in such uh, procedures. And in my opinion, efficient um, remedy, but it's not used very often in practice, I'm afraid, the right of the just public servant, not em all employees, but public servant to be transferred to another work post. Um, maybe I will uh, add uh, to this, uh, to this uh, regulation that also, the Market in Financial Instruments Act uh, is given the specific uh, specific protection to whistleblowers. Uh, explicitly, it explicitly protects the reporting person against the termination of the employment contract. It specif specifies that uh, the reporting the violation cannot be the valid reason for the termination, and also uh, it's uh, explicitly protects the reporting person from the liability for damages. All other financial sector acts just impose the obligation of employer to employer to establish measures to prevent the retaliation or to establish measures to um, remedy possible consequences of uh, retaliation. Uh, but as I said, all this protection that I have mentioned now uh, is uh, focused on the um, on the employees or public servants reporting corruption or reporting um, breaches of the of the legislation in the financial sector for all, all other uh, employees or public servants only the general protect labor law protection is applicable uh, slovenian uh, labor legislation gives a comprehensive uh, protection uh, it's uh, this, the regulation is uh, follows the, the binding uh, international documents and the Euro, uh, European directives. Uh, and in my opinion, the most uh, important protection is the protection regarding the harassment, mobbing, and also discrimination, and the protection against unlawful termination of employment contract. As the discrimination uh, is concerned, I, sh I have to um, point out that in Slovenia, according to Slovenian legislation, the list of possible uh, personal circumstances in, in the context of discrimination is not closed. Uh, so whistleblowing is not specified specifically as, a, as these personal circumstances, but could be one of those. As I said, the, the list is not, not closed. Um, so maybe I will uh, point out that the reverse burden of proof is, uh, in, uh, is uh, de determined in both cases, in both procedures. And uh, important is also the compensation in case of harassment, mobbing, and discrimination. This compensation should be effective and needs to discourage the employer from the repeating the violation. So is it this punitive function of the compensation? 
not very much used, I'm afraid, in practice if we consider the, the amounts of the compensation, but I hope this is going to be improved. Uh, and also the protection against unlawful termination is also uh, comprehensive. Employer need a justified reason. Uh, some reasons are listed as unfounded reasons. The whistleblowing is not one of them, but uh, similar unfounded reason is when employee is uh, involved in a procedure against the employer because employer was violating, has been violating his duties uh, against the employees. So also the burden of proof rests with the employer and the employee, uh, and employee has the right to be reintegrated into the, um, uh, the working uh, process if the termination was illegal. Mm. So th this is, the, this is the, the labor law protection. And for the conclusion, uh, as you can see in Slovenia, there is a specific protection for certain types of uh, report, reported violations or in certain sectors and general labor law protection. So I think in Slovenia, we need to, head from, to be headed from particular provisions to comprehensive regulation. We should broaden the personal and material scope of protection. And by implement, in implementing the directive, we should use the solutions from the Slovene sectoral acts and of course, good practices from other legal systems. And I'm sure that this conference and this, the project will help all of us to, to learn from each other. So I would like to thank you for your attendance. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, as we see, and we know the Slovenian uh, legislation on whistleblowing is one of the most advanced uh, in Europe. And now uh, we will have the chance to, uh, to listen uh, to the um, presentation of uh, Mrs. Czarny Pretnar. Uh, so thank you once again, Professor uh, Sanchur Pecek, and uh, we will have a, an exceptional occasion now uh, to get acquainted uh, with the latest uh, bill, which uh, even improves <laughs> the advanced uh, legislation of the Slovenian Republic. Mrs. Maja Czarny Pretnar is um, a representative of uh, Ministry of uh, Justice, uh, where she works at the Office of International Cooperation and International Legal Assistance. And uh, she is personally responsible for works uh, on the bill transposing the EU whistleblowing directive. Despite, I suppose, uh, many uh, duties, uh, she uh, is also a PhD candidate uh, at the Ljubljana uh, University. And she's also taking part in several working groups on European Union level and is a contact person for HAC conference. So we are very, very happy to be probably uh, some of the first persons to get acquainted with, uh, with this bill. We are looking forward to your speech. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mrs. Kupien. Uh, good morning also from Ljubljana. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation uh, to participate in this very important and useful debate. Um, I'm happy to share our experience uh, from the point of view, as you mentioned, of the legislation drafter um, and looking forward to hearing the experience of other countries. Um, as the previous uh, speaker shed a light already on the Slovenian existing legislation, uh, I will build on this knowledge and uh, start directly with the short introduction of the transposition process. Uh, the emphasis uh, will be then on the challenges since for the time being, no political decision has been taken yet. So I, I cannot really present uh, a, a paper, but it is a question of challenges of uh, uh, that the, the, the issues that the, that the drafter is, uh, is uh, taking into account. Um, so uh, therefore in the transposing then this particular directive, of course, the challenge is that this is an overarching directive, which already is covering a number of fields and subjects and already existing regulation. With this in mind, a thorough examination of the directive and especially its annexes, so annex, annex one and two, was performed 
And uh, then the existing national legislation was examined, followed by the compatibility check. And this then gave the ground on deciding on the type of regulation and the scope of it. So the focus of this presentation will be on setting up legal remedies. So uh, in the essence, the directive is uh, upgrading supervision of exercising EU law by providing protection to persons who report on breaches of law. It is envisaged to do so by amending or unchanging the existing regulation in 10 sectors. So in financial, environmental, health, also in the maritime law. It's almost all the, all the sectors that we can uh, imagine. Uh, when the, so when the national law uh, that affected by all this mentioned regulation was reviewed, the results of their intervention in the, in the already existing national law would be needed in the, that was, the number was more than 60 regulations. So therefore the solution of amending each and, and every one of these uh, regulation was not really a favorite one. Uh, also the international comparative study that was, connect, that was conducted presented results that majority of countries that already regulated this issue have undertaken the path of overarching, a single overarching document. Uh, therefore, also, it was suggested that there should be an overarching document with the title for the protection of persons reporting on breaches of law. As I said, this is a suggestion. No political decision has been taken yet. So please take that into account. Uh, so the com compatibility check uh, refers, to, of course, to the substance of regulation. Uh, with the overarching nature of the directive, we need to check the overlapping of provisions uh, as well as identifying the gaps. So these are the four points uh, mentioned here. Uh, they present really the new ideas to Slovenian legislation. So protection in case of public disclosure, uh, as it was already explained uh, by previous speaker, uh, there is no specific provision uh, in law. Uh, however, public disclosure constitutes as part of constitutionally protected right as print of speech and it was already dealt with then in the labor court and, in, and confirmed at the Supreme Court. And also, so the suggestions from the experts were that uh, were leaning for, towards to an explicit provision also on, the, on this issue. Uh, the question of setting up a special legal judicial remedy, maybe I should more talk about judicial remedy than, than legal, uh, in, in order to enable the reporting person uh, who suffers of retali retaliation measures to get a judicial order to stop these measures and to acquire the compensation. So this, the existing legal frame already enables some protection. Uh, however, the understanding uh, of the, the purposes of the directive, it demands more. So this was a suggestion. Uh, then the interesting question of rewarding a whistleblower is the directive more of a suggestion or better said, uh, directive does not contradict this type of stimulation. Um, however, uh, I mean, of course the practitioners uh, that are uh, defending whistleblowers uh, are putting very much of emphasis on this issue. Uh, on the other hand, the member states are quite reluctant. Uh, they do not want, of course, they do not want to stimulate false reporting. I will get to this question later. Um, the question of expanding the protection also to the private sector um, relates, uh, was in directive more to the question of internal reporting. Um, in this case, it is a political decision to decide if the protection should be broader than directive. Of course, directive sets the, the minimum standard. Uh, in, in, in this particular question, whether it would be requested for the subjects with less than 50 employer, employees to have it. This is still quite a question. However, the business sector uh, is preparing a new ISO standard that will require an effective and efficient internal reporting channel. So already in the business sector themselves, the, the, the business sector itself is preparing uh, on these questions. Um, now, if we go to uh, 
So this is just to remind you of the previous presentation, just a, a quick uh, remembrance, uh, that was already explained in detail the legal remedy, which is set up by the general uh, labor law legal framework. Um, and it also it was the conclusion that is not uh, it, it's not clear enough and definitely it does not uh, entail all the retaliation measures that the directive is, um, is, is naming. Um, so the general legal protection in the field of labor law is conducted then in the special, in specialized labor court and of course undertaking the procedure that is adapted to the labor law rights. Um, the anti-corruption law, so the integrity and Prevention of Corruption Law uh, Act uh, was studied as an example of administrative procedure remedy with the addition then of procedure in criminal court. While on the other hand, the Protection Against Discrimination Act uh, was studied because it sets up a special legal remedy that anyone who was a victim of discrimination can use in order to get a recognition that it was a discrimination against him and the compensation for it. But this is the anyone, not work related. Um, so, uh, however, the procedural aspect in this Protection Against Discrimination Act, um, the procedural aspect is based on the civil procedure with some specific provisions and not on the, on the, on the specialized labor law. Uh, specific. Um, so for the, the Lege Ferenda, so the suggestions, so based on what was said, the suggestions were presented along the line of setting up a new special remedy and um, stemming from the directive uh, where the basic grounds for protection is defined as some kind of work related uh, relationship and it's much broader that we already have any of any legislation we have now. Um, it was suggested that uh, this protection should be provided in the labor court because of the this specific indication of work related uh, factor. Uh, so, uh, and also the suggestions were also in the procedural aspect. So in the sense of exemption of paying court fee, that was one of the uh, suggestions. Um, the, also the participation of competent body, uh, it's meant in the judicial proceedings. So, and also the reverse burden of proof. So this is the, the pinpoints that were already in the, this specific procedural um, provisions uh, for the, at the specialized labor court should be maybe a bit upgraded. That was the, uh, the, uh, the suggestions. Um, and then to broaden maybe the scope of protection. So the question who gets protected um, would be, uh, I guess it would be we following the directive since it's quite broad. Um, and there was also no other suggestion that it should be even broader. Uh, uh, it, it was considered quite broad also by all the, 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 uh, the experts that we uh, discussed. So the provision um, who benefits of protection will be new because we, in, the, in, uh, in national law, we do not have such a broad uh, protect, uh, provision. Um, and therefore it will include all the subjects who will be exposed to uh, retaliation measures because of the connection with the reporting person. Um, the protection of whistleblower's identity. Um, this issue, as the uh, previous speaker already explained, um, has been dealt with in the, uh, I call it Anti-Corruption Act. It's Integrity and, Pre and Prevention of Corruption Act, but to, to, uh, to simplify just Anti-Corruption Act. And of course the GDPR pr provisions are uh, applied as well. Um, and uh, similar to Anti-Corruption Act, uh, the fine, um, it will be imposed on the person who shares the information that is uh, considered protected. Um, the question of support measures um, in the sense of legal remedy uh, entails more of providing information or even legal representation by an employee of the competent body who has credentials to act, to act in court. This is a similar solution um, that uh, this uh, similar solution is it's used also in the Protection Against the Discrimination Act. This, uh, this is the part that's why we are studying it. Um, 
setting up uh, the protection from liability as the um, as it was explained before there is no sp special protection from the civil liability so this is a uh, a question that would uh, require a special provision also then from the, whether in the judicial proceedings or in the, uh, the question how the information was acquired or also from breaching uh, non-disclosure non -disclosure clause you know, like in trade secrets. Um, so um, at this point, um, also the directive itself recalls the directive on trade secrets from 2016 uh, where the disclosure is allowed under certain conditions. One of them being if the union law demands so. So um, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the directive, um, it is explained that, this, that these two directives are actually back to back. So they do not confront each other, but they are back to back directives. Um, and this directive was transposed also into Slovenian uh, legislation. It was done, that was done by uh, Trade Secrets Act. Uh, now the question of interlocutory measures. Um, uh, this is an already known uh, uh, instrument uh, also in the general labor law protection. Uh, and it would be useful to undertake it also in the scope of, the, uh, of this special remedy um, as well. So, uh, to have this preventive uh, measure. Um, then we had the suggested claims of, of uh, whistleblower. So how, so what the, what the whistleblower can claim in, in this special remedy. Um, suggestions are um, to, to declare, just to, de just to declare that the retaliation has indeed occurred and uh, to get the compensation that maybe in some other civil proceeding, maybe that is already on the way. Um, also then to declare the retaliation has occurred and to reward compensation as well. And the types of compensation, this will be, will be following more or less the employment relationship X, um, which is then so material, non-material, um, and as it is explained in the article eight of uh, employment relation X, it has to be effective, proportional to the damage, and it needs to discourage the employer from repeating the violation. So this is uh, this is a provision that will that will probably uh, in, in Include it if, if this suggestion is taken upon. Um, also, uh, another claim that could be made is uh, to demand the publication of court's decision so that the, it's it's out in the media. Um, now, of course, this is now the, 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 the till now um, the presentation was about the protection of the reporting person. Um, of course, the, also the uh, direct, uh, directive acknowledges that not all the reporting persons are acting in good faith or for the general welfare, whatever we like it. Um, for that reason, uh, um, the directive states that uh, the, the person, persons concerned fully enjoy the right to an effective remedy and to a fair trial, as well as the presumption of innocence and the rights of defense, including the right to be heard and the right to access their file. Um, now, the, the identity of person concerned is protected for as long as, as investigations are ongoing. Um, the similar pr provision um, is also in the uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Act and is, uh, there is also recalling the GDPR and, um, and denies the use of Public Information Access Act. So they cannot get the information, of course, when the, the, the whole uh, process is ongoing. Uh, penalties against the person who knowingly report or publicly disclose false information should be uh, effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. Um, this is a similar provision also in Anti-Corruption Act. Um, it also, when you have in the part of the penalties uh, that is uh, it's uh, one of the major ones, I think. Um, and then, of course, the compensation for damages resulting from such reporting. Um, of course, it's possible already now. It's either in the general civil court or maybe in the labor court. It, it depends on uh, on the on the uh, on the procedure on the base on the basis of what happened. Um, so um, the challenge uh, for the legislator. Um, 
with with transposing this directive is uh, is to find uh, a delicate balance, of course, between ensuring sufficient protection for the whistleblower to feel safe enough to report on the one hand, and on the other hand, not to stimulate false reporting. This is another issue that was brought up more or less by the courts. They have already uh, some experience uh, with false reporting and some people that just like to be in the court. And uh, so this is, it's, it's really a delicate balance. Uh, so th this is from my side. Uh, thank you for your for your attention, and uh, I'm open to the question. Thank you, Mrs. Charny Pretnar. Thank you so much for this interesting presentation. Now I would like to start the discussion part. Uh, as it concerns questions and answers, um, thank you. We have questions from Canberra. Par partially answered by our speakers, but let me uh, read uh, the questions. So there is one uh, question open to be to answered, be answered. Uh, yeah. namely, does the French requirement for disinterested disclosure apply in Slovenia? Let me also read the questions which were already answered so that they could be also translated into Slovak, Hungarian, Czech and Polish languages. Who decided whether a whistleblower is disinterested? And Professor Bargain answered First, the superior or the, or the employer, then authorities, and if there is a litigation, certainly judges. The second question of Mrs. Uh, Valerie Sands was, in the Slovenian system, does the whistleblower have a task of proving or providing evidence that the disclosure is true? And the answer of Professor Senčur Peček, in case of reporting corruption, the reasonable conclusion of reporting person that the information is true is needed. With the burden of proof resting on the employer, what does the employer have to prove? So this is the European Union legislation, in fact, that has direct sense here. The facts giving grounds for the suspicion that for example, the prohibition of discrimination has been violated. I would like to invite other persons to ask questions or to present comments on the question and answers mode. But in the meantime, I would like uh, to ask uh, a question myself to all speakers. Namely, I would like to ask you, how do you see the present role of trade unions and other worker representatives in whistleblowing procedures, uh, in internal channels, setting up maybe? And uh, how do you see it in the future, especially if the Slovenian bill enhances this participation, this dialogue uh, with, with uh, social partners? And um, Another question, as it concerns the catalog, the future catalog of, of, of breaches in your respective countries, um, do you see a need to uh, introduce into this catalog also breaches of workers' rights? Because this aspect is absent from the EU whistleblowing uh, directive. And finally, um, Referring to the, to the speech of uh, Professor Guanola Bargain, um, how do you see uh, the enlargement of a personal scope to legal persons? What was suggested in your presentation? Any pros and cons of, of, of such an enlargement of, uh, of a personal scope? Thank you. So uh, I do not see any questions. So perhaps if the speakers could uh, uh, react now, Gwenola, me? yes, or yeah, no, <laughs> in order again. of appearance, uh, maybe, yes. Gwenola. Yes, uh, first of all, about the role of trade unions. Um, of course, um, I think currently in France, the debate is about the protection of uh, trade unions as being a whistleblower, as being whistleblowers. Um, so it's 
you know, the, the role of trade unions is linked to this discussion. But if just currently we see that trade unions are not, cannot benefit from this protection, uh, of course, they have a role to uh, support whistleblower. But um, for example, we have a problem in France, uh, um, a labor inspector uh, has disclosed uh, information from a, a company and um, uh, this disclosure uh, was addressed to um, unions. And now this labor inspector is prosecuted for having uh, disclosed this uh, info this uh, those in those facts um, so trade unions have uh, communicated about um, this disclosure disclosure but um, they have no problem with that um, the problem is for the labor inspector currently so they can support uh, whistleblower and um, um, currently I have no example of a trade union um, we which is uh, prosecuted for uh, having uh, uh, helped uh, a whistleblower. But maybe it's for, you know, um, um, ONG um, association that can be uh, protected as a whistleblower. It could be maybe uh, something uh, better to um, guarantee uh, this support. Um, but of course it's, um, it's a vague scenario uh, and uh, it needs a lot of uh, um, more accurate uh, um, features to understand how a legal entity could be uh, a whistleblower. And for the catalog of breaches, um, to my opinion, uh, in France, we, we do not need um, um, to add uh, this uh, breach of workers' rights because you see, the catalog is really uh, broad. Uh, of course, the question is about third directive, the European directive, and um, I'm quite um, uh, shocked by the fact that uh, um, the breach of workers' rights uh, is not mentioned by uh, the catalog, but in France, it's not a, a problem. Thank you so much. Uh, Daria, if I may <laughs> ask yeah, you to uh, respond. Uh, as uh, employees' representatives are concerned, in, in Slovenia, uh, I think that this this topic, the, the, the influence of the trade unions and the representatives who are directly elected, uh, should be uh, should be uh, regulated uh, by this new regulation of the whistleblowers, uh, especially when those internal channels will be established uh, as the uh, as, as to the general regulation of Slo uh, general uh, legislation of Slovenia uh, trade unions and works councils they do have the certain role while uh, general acts of employers are adopted so uh, i suppose that those uh, I, and i assume that those uh, internal channels will be uh, established by uh, by general acts of of uh, employers so uh, this is one one point and another is that uh, in slovenia we our reg regulation of the uh, uh, of the role of the uh, um, uh, directly uh, elected representatives works councils this legislation is quite old is from 90s and i um, assume that this lo law will have to be will have to be amended uh, and in this amendment many new topics should be involved for for the for works councils and one of them would be the protection of whistleblowers so I'm, i my answer would be that they need a greater role in in this process as the legal entity as a whistleblower is concerned this is quite interesting idea i have to admit but in my opinion at the end you always come to the physical person who is working in the name of who is acting in a as for a person for a legal entity so I don't have my opinion yet about this, but uh, in my opinion, you always have physical uh, person at the end. Uh, so the question of uh, workers' rights, maybe there is not so much need to include those workers' rights into the protection of whistleblowers as the general labor protection is always already, already, already covered this labor law rights. For example, as I said, as I mentioned, if you, I don't know if employee is a, 
participating in a process against the employer because on the on the claiming that the employer was violating employees' rights. This is also regulated by ILO convention that this could not be founded reason for valid reason for determination. So maybe this is not so urgent because it is also covered by by other legislation, other but yeah, other instrument. But of course, it could be. It could be. It's, I'm not saying no, but it, maybe it's not so necessary. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, maybe to start with this, the last the last question um, with the retaliation measures. Um, the directive, um, of of course, as I said, is overarching. So it's already. Um, take into account all this previous regulation and legislation that is already uh, in in place by the by you, and then some, of course, also from the international, because some some uh, some uh, regulations are uh, are composed of both of it. Um, so and also the directive it does not have an exhaustive list; it just has exam for example, and then it of course then it has like. One like, like more than, than ten examples. There is no, uh, as you uh, rightly pointed out, no which uh, of working working rights. But uh, as the previous speaker said, both of them, I agree. Uh, it's it's already it's already included in the in the in this existing legislation. So I, I don't think that it needs to be. Uh, Put more ex explicit, or maybe and the, this maybe now it leads to the to the uh, to another answer of the uh, uh, of the trade unions uh, cooperation. Um, they will be definitely included. Um, the thing is, for the moment, um, this the, the the we're still in this in the stage of the internal writing, so it was not. Uh, Your, of your course. Voice is, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Now. Yes. Now it's okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's. Um, oh, sorry. Um, well. Um, of, of course, the the legislative procedure itself uh, it demands. Uh, of course, all this type, all types of, com of, of consultation, but especially when it comes to the question of labor law and workers' rights, the trade unions are. Uh, it, it, it cannot it cannot pass without them uh, they're also um, they are consulted in um, unofficially officially they have the special counsel with the uh, with in the government in in that procedure already so um, they were definitely involved in um, in uh, in drafting the law and uh, and also in the, uh, the the question of setting up this uh, internal um, uh, channel uh, reporting channels um, yes we we were discussing this uh, this question to 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 maybe link it to the already existing legislation as uh, as the trade unions and and the, and the working councils that already are set up um, also the, the the numbers of empl employee of employees needed to constitute a working council i think it's uh, it's it, it's it, uh, it's kind of compatible, also uh, also stemming from the from the EU regulation and international re um, regulations. So it is it is compatible, but it will take some work um, since um, it it is a very uh, complicated directive because it is really really this yes. overarching. If you if you see in the end the annexes of one and two, and then it says like. For the first annex, it will change. It it may change or uh, amend. And for the second annex, annex it's only amending. It uh, it it really is a, a a puzzle. It's it's a puzzle to put together. So um, we are doing the puzzle yes. now. <laughs> yes, that's true. Thank you so much. Um, so my proposal now uh, is that if any new questions or answers appear, the speakers could react during the second session. Uh, please kindly ask questions and answers only within this mode, not on chat. I see one question from, from the chat, which uh, mm, I think may be, may be answered uh, quickly uh, by, by all our speakers. And I will read uh, the uh, two other uh, very precise uh, questions. Uh, and I kindly ask speakers to answer these questions uh, uh, in a written form, uh, if you may, okay? I will read the questions. Would it be 
politically or legally possible to make knowingly false, namely malicious disclosures, a criminal offense. So I kindly ask speakers to reflect and answer in a written form, yes. Do you consider creating special body, House of Whistleblowers in your countries? Also, please kindly write an answer, okay, to us all. And now in a brief form, please kindly respond to the question on the chat, namely, how the good faith of a whistleblower is verified. Starting <laughs> with Maya, maybe <laughs> from the yes, from the last. Uh, well, uh, how the good faith <laughs> is verified. Uh, I think that's a, that uh, that would be uh, a question for for the uh, maybe uh, commission maybe for the corruption. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Maybe professor. Uh, I mean, I cannot I, uh, as a practitioner. I cannot say. So. <laughs> if tomorrow, I may ask but... Professor Sanchez Petrov to answer, yeah. yes. Uh, according to the Slovenian regulation, this is the matter for the commission, and commission yes. will take into consideration the gravity of the this. Um, violation, then uh, I'm reading now the law, the, it's taking into consideration the, the damage caused by the reported conduct, then duty of, uh, of this re reporting person of protecting certain uh, data, and the, to whom this uh, disclosure was, was revealed. So all these effects are, are given, they're taking into consideration while, um, uh, while deciding whether this was good faith or bad faith. And maybe I can answer also that if, if the, uh, this disclosure was in bad faith, this is uh, the, not the uh, criminal offense, but could be minor offense according to the Slovenian yeah. and, uh, uh, Integrity and Prevention of Cor sure, Corruption yes. Act. So, yeah. And as, as it concerns France. In France, you have to prove the bad faith. So uh, if the superior of uh, uh, the authority or uh, the defender of rights uh, um, um, evaluates uh, the alert as being uh, um, of bad faith. So you have to prove this. So you can prove this by the will of cause of damage or something else, but it's not uh, uh, precisely um, defined. So you have to, to prove this and you can uh, uh, use different kinds of, uh, of proof, but you know, it's quite uh, it's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's with a huge regret that I have to close up now this extremely interesting session. Thank you so much, dear speakers. And I kindly ask uh, Professor Sentur Pecek to take the seat at the president's uh, table now. Uh, and let me only check if all uh, the participants, the speakers at the second session are now um, present. So in order of appearance, Professor Jan Picht, University, Charles University in Prague. Have you joined us, Professor? Yes, joined. Yes. Good moment. I prepare my presentation. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Good morning. Jakub Moravec, Charles University of Prague. Uh, Mr. Jakub Varvazovski, yeah, yeah, Foundation, yes. Ożiveni, Professor Attila Kuhn, Karoli yes. Gaspar University, yes, of the Reformed Church in Hungary, Professor Robert Schuche. So there will be no pair. <laughs> yes, uh, me personally, I'm, I'm here as a speaker now. And um, Professor uh, Varga, Veronica. Um, I'm here. Hello. Yes, Trnava, Trnava University of, of Trnava. Professor yes. Peter won't be attending today. I alone will be presenting. Yes, yes, of course. So thank you very much. And the second session is, is open now. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dagmara, for giving me this opportunity to chair this panel. It is, it is a huge uh, honor, but also an obligation. This is my first time for chairing such a panel in a virtual surrounding. So I hope this is going to be work, uh, everything is going to work fine. I have to inform everybody that prof, uh, Dr. Uh, Moravec has uh, wrote, written to me that he has his problems with the computer. So I hope he will join us just uh, with presentation, but without, without camera. 
And now, if I may, I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Pichert, but a few words uh, before he will start the presentation. Uh, professor Pichert is a professor at the Faculty of Law uh, in uh, Charles oh. University in Prague, and he is also head of the Department of Labor and uh, Social Security Law, uh, also well-known uh, scientist, also the president of the Czech Society for Labor Law and Social Security Law, and the vice president of the International Society for Labor and Social Security Law. So I'm very happy to announce that Professor Pichert will now give his speech about the history and attempts to regulate whistleblowing in the Czech Republic. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I have uh, some uh, disturbing message that my Zoom cannot recognize my video camera. Uh, yesterday it was uh, everything okay, so I'm sorry for this now, but uh, I hope you see my presentation and the, the, the main. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, fair of point. Uh, before prof before proceeding on the topic of my contribution, please allow me to thank one again to organizers, Professor Skupeň and her team from the University of Lodz for the organizing of this online conference. As you probably know, uh, Professor Skupeň originally intended uh, to organize this first meeting in the form of a traditional conference in Prague. The Prague Faculty of Law agreed to lend its premises free of charge for this purpose Unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic was against this idea and the situation in Prague is now really serious. Uh, Professor Kuklik, Dean of the Prague Faculty of Law, whom I would also like to thank, again met the new date requirement from the organizers and uh, promised to provide the necessary premises for the conference in Prague on May the 15th to uh, 2021. Um, so hopefully we will meet in person in Prague in better times. However, the final decision of uh, whether the conference will take place on the 15th May 2021 in Prague will depend on the decision of the organizers of the conference from University Lodge, will depend on the current epidemiological situation, which is unfortunately now impossible to predict. We must all hope for a better tomorrow. Um, now um, I'll turn to the topic of my lecture. Sometime less is more. I am almost certain that uh, this English proverb has an equivalent in the languages of the representatives of all the countries participating uh, in this conference. Unfortunately, uh, for a short history of attempts to regulate whistleblowing in the legislation of Czech Republic, uh, it is probably difficult to find a more appropriate uh, statement. A total of four legislative proposal, proposals from the government, senators and deputies in the recent years, and two proposals that are now in fact awaiting discussion in the Chamber of Deputies, represent uh, an incredible amount of legislative work uh, that has not yet reached its fulfillment. So we do not yet have specific regulation of whistleblowers in the Czech Republic. Nowadays, only small instruments of, for the protection of whistleblowers exist in Czech law. Furthermore, they are fragmented in the various legal regulations. The following lecture of my colleague, Mr. Moravec, will be devoted to the current situation. While the lectures will then certainly deal with the new proposals for the intended future comprehensive legal regulation of whistleblowing in the legal order of the Czech Republic. Uh, now I would like to describe briefly, in particular, the four previous uh, proposals. Repeated unsuccessful attempts to legally enshrine the protection of whistleblowers in the Czech legal system uh, in the last decade have uh, provided uh, some insights that should be taken into account during current work on transporting the common EU legal framework for whistleblowing into the Czech legal order. The first proposal from the government from 2012 um, 
In November 2012, the government of Peter Nechas approved the substantive intent of the law on the protection of notifiers of criminal offenses, whistleblowing, which was submitted by Carolina Peek, former deputy prime minister. The government wanted to fulfill quickly and without much legislative work one of the points of its program statement, the fight against corruption. The government did not want to prepare a comprehensive regulation of whistleblower protection and did not want to project liberally the elements of protection into several existing regulations. It has simply placed the whistleblower as for consequences as well as for instruments of protection in line with the other persons protected by the Anti-Discrimination Act, means on the grounds of se gender, sexual orientation, race, disability, etc. The proposed uh, regulation protected uh, the whistleblower very simply by incorporating his protection into already existing regulation the Anti-Discrimination Act. The unsuitability of the regulation of whistleblowers protection under the Anti-Discrimination Act has been criticized by many experts after, all, after the fall of the government in 2013, the proposal and concept were not further worked on. The second proposal, a uh, proposal from a group of senators from 2013, was particularly interesting in that in the first play, place among uh, its uh, submitters uh, in the group of senators was listed Libor Michalek. In 2010, before he was elected senator, this man became one of the most famous Czech whistleblowers in connection with his uh, criminal complaint for an overpriced contract and his subsequent dismissal from the position of director of the State Environmental Fund. The legislative proposal submitted by the senators, also it uh, chose the way of a separate law, was to apply only to some employees, especially in the public sector, and only to some very specifically defined amount on impending damage, etc. specifically defined acts, and especially uh, was very insufficiently legislative elaborated. The Senate uh, therefore returned it to the submitters for completion, which has never happened. The third proposal from a group of deputies from 2016 uh, was submitted in uh, 2016 by Andrei Babish, um, current premier, prime minister, uh, and uh, at the, that time, the minister of finance. It was not submitted as a government proposal, but as a parliamentary proposal. The proposal was significantly inspired uh, by the then already effective Slovak law um, on the protecting of whistleblowers. It was therefore an attempt to comprehensively uh, regulate the protection of whistleblowers in a separate law. According to this proposal, a wide range of persons could file a notification only in cases of exhaustively listed criminal offenses. Opponents of the proposal pointed, in particular, to the fact that the status of a protected whistleblower should have been granted by the public prosecutor's office. It means the public authority, which primarily represents a public action in criminal matters. The concept, which included the consent of the labor office to certain legal actions of the employer in relation to the protected employee, whistleblower, was also problematic, etc. This proposal did not even pass the first reading, 
the discussion of the proposal discontinued upon the end of the election period. The fourth proposal from the government from 2017, unsuccessful attempt, seems to symbolically close the circle of hitherto fruitless attempts. In an effort to find a simple solution to a complex problem, it was very close to the first proposal, but this time the government did not try to proceed by extending the list of discriminatory grounds as well, uh, as was uh, the case uh, of the first proposal from the government in 2012. The fourth attempts so to ensure the protection of whistleblowers by adding a single paragraph to section 133a of the Code of Civil Procedure, which would extend to whistleblowers the already existing regulation of so-called inverted burden of proof in civil proceedings. So the proposal was simplistic again. It did not introduce a special notification system and also did not include the obligation to introduce internal channels for notification, etc. The proposal submitted at the very end of the legislative uh, of the election period uh, of the Chamber of uh, Deputies did not get into the next stages of the legislative process. Summary. Um, from today's point of view, in particular taking into account uh, the need for timely transposition of directive, none of these four previous legislative proposals have approached the level and method of protection required today by the directive. Some of the proposals, two of them, tried to downplay this complex problem by trying to solve it with a single paragraph inserted into an existing regulation. Unfortunately, some of these proposals were led by an effort to fulfill a program item or to convince the public that something is going on in this regard and to draw the public's attention to the submitter rather than by a serious effort to improve something. The benefit of the previous proposal is undoubtedly at least the fact that the Czech public became more acquainted with the concept of whistleblowing, almost unknown before 2012. Uh, 2012 yeah. Whether the past unsuccessful attempts have contributed to the Czech improvement of the historically rather negative opinion of the citizen of the Czech Republic on the need for such a regulation, it will be answered, as I conclude from the conference program, by other speakers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Pichert, for your presentation. And I would again uh, like to uh, invite all the participants to, to add certain questions to our uh, speakers. Uh, I'm sure that you have a lot of questions regarding the regulation in all uh, Visegrad uh, countries. So uh, now we will continue with the, uh, Dr. Moravec. I hope that Dr. Moravec is with us. I, I know that you have problems with the camera, but will you present the presentation uh, without camera, I, I suppose. So uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Moravec. He's also from the, uh, uh, from the Charles University in Prague, an academic counselor and fac faculty member at the Department of Labor Law and Social Security Law. Uh, he's also the uh, well-known writer, uh, working on projects, also the vice president of the Czech Society for Labor Law and Social Security Law. He was awarded Lawyer of the Year in 2012. So we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Marovac with us. And please uh, start with your speech.
We cannot hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, <laughs> please. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, there are professor, thank you kindly for the floor. Uh, their colleagues, first of all, my apologies. Uh, I can start the PC after the morning Windows update and this another one doesn't have a camera. And so um, my, my team, please allow me to present you with a brief report of the current legal regulation concerning whistleblower protection under Czech law. I will be mentioning only the basic points of this issue. I refer to the national report in detail. My colleague from the Czech Ministry of Justice will provide you with information concerning the draft legislation for the Whistleblower Protection Act. And finally, uh, my colleague from a non-profit organization will be speaking to you about experience in terms of whistleblower protection under the current rules. At present, uh, there is no comprehensive whistleblowing regulation in the Czech Republic. However, it's uh, currently being prepared for the health to the European Direct. It can be considered that uh, the adoption of the General, uh, um, General Whistleblowing Act will not lead to the repeal of the personal special legal regul uh, regulation currently in place. We have a special legislation on certain aspects of whistleblowing for the civil service and the banking sector. In the area of civil service, this will be government regulation number 14550. The regulation to establish internal notification channels as well as the duty to appoint and investigate. It further adds for the deadline for investigating a case and the duty to maintain confidentiality of the whistleblower's identity. However, uh, the government degree that is intended for the civil service rises up in terms of constitutional conformity. The reason is this case in uh, insufficient legal basis. The government regulation also presents some additional problems. For example, only a civil servant can be a whistleblower and be the one who reports on unlawful conduct. In addition, protective measures are also missing in the regulation. In the case of the banking sector, some partial, especially organizational issue uh, concerning whistleblowing are addressed by degree number 163 for uh, 2014, which was uh, issued by the Czech National Bank. Except for these cases, certain uh, general protection stems from general legal regulations uh, that is to stay labor law uh, regulation, the labor code uh, regulation on the protection of personal data, and uh, from general legal stems and principles. It is possible to deduce from the general legal regulation that an unjustified sanction is prohibited. And uh, by extension, any retaliatory uh, measures take both against the whistleblower and his or her close relative as well. 
uh, the same applies um, to other person, for example, self-employed partners in business corporation, etc., who are in the position of whistleblowers or person who are like related uh, to them. From the standpoint of uh, the GIF issue, it's uh, essentially that uh, neither in labor, uh, labor, uh, labor, <laughs> labor law relations, not in service relations, is uh, possible to terminate an employment relationship or more uh, specialty service relationship for no reason at all. Likewise, uh, one of uh, no one can be transferred to another job uh, without any reason. Yeah, it is an uh, illegal action taken by the employer, unreasonable termination of employment, uh, unreasonable failure to provide remuneration, etc. The standard path of justical protection can be followed. Uh, that is a uh, lawsuit for damages or for uh, inviolate termination of employment can be filed by the affected uh, employee whistleblower and provided that he she prevails and wishes to continue to be employed. He she may be uh, entitled supplementary compensation of legs or salary for the periods in dispute when he she was prevented from uh, performing work. In this context, the issue is primarily to like the cost of court proceeding. One of the reasons for this situation is the in um, insufficient uh, involvement of trade unions. Trade unions legally uh, represent employees only in a few cases per year. Uh, the court is between three or and five thousand new labor disputes a year. So some ways, which involving resolved namely by the internal regulation of larger companies in connection in connection with the legal regulation concerning the criminal liability of legal uh, the criminal liability of legal person and the legal regulation concerning examiners principles the attribution uh, of employees' unlawful conduct to the employment. Legal entity or nature person was in, who is engaged in a business activity. Unless uh, they have taken internal organization measures uh, so as to eliminate some such undesirable conduct. Whereas uh, the form of such systems is not prescribed by nature, it's rather a private initiative. And so the individual systems as far differ considerably. Uh, whistleblower regulation is not commonly found in the collective bargains agreement. The duty to notify bodies that are active in criminal proceedings applies to use criminal offenses which are listed in the penal code. Section 368 Penal Code. Furthermore, uh, for, from a certain point of view, the duty to notify arrays from European regulations on personal data protection and uh, in the field of electronic communication. As mentioned in the introduction, I would now like to refer the national report for the Czech Republic, which has been processed as part of the project. Thank you kindly for your attention.
and have a nice day. Thank you to Dr. Moravec for your uh, contribution. Um, now we still will stay in uh, in in the check uh, in, in the check into the check uh, regulation or situation regarding the protection of whistleblower. Namely, uh, our next speaker is uh, Jakub Varvajovski. I hope I have pronounced it well uh, from the Ojiveni. Uh, Mr. Varvajovsky was a uh, communication expert for the Office of Government of the Czech Republic. He takes part in the Radicalization Awareness Network under the European Commission, and his focus is in public communication of the work of various NGOs and networking of larger platforms to enhance the communication capabilities of their members. So, uh, Mr. Varvajovsky, please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, hello from Czech Republic. And I hopefully start my presentation now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, my job is uh, to present you uh, our communication, our communication strategy. And Yes, super, super. So yeah, uh, my job is in a communication, which means uh, that we are focused uh, on uh, how to communicate Czech public uh, about the topic of whistleblowing and also how they can actually become a whistleblower. And our, our organization, Oživení, uh, we are helping people to fight the corruption. We are a team of uh, lawyers that will give them the advice and take them through the process of uh, telling people about crimes. So uh, we have teamed up with the company, research company Behavior, and they did uh, this research for us. Uh, they have like a database of 14,000 people in Czech Republic. They have them segmented. Uh, so uh, when they do the research, they have the same amount of people that they are in the society. So I'm very confident in the in the research. And 2000 people actually took part in the research. And so what we have found out, it's not very good. As you can see, 18% uh, of respondents have seen some illegal conduct which is not to say that actually half of the people answer that they think there was something unethical going on in their company, but they don't have a proof. So these 18% are actually people who are sure that something bad has happened. Uh, and the question is, will they try to report it? Uh, are we in the position when we will be protecting whistleblowers, we will actually have the whistleblowers? And the answer is, well, no. Uh, the thing is that most of them will uh, try to report it, yeah, but uh, the third of them will go to their family or their co-workers. And if you look at the number of 53%, 50, uh, basically in 53% of cases when they try to tell to someone, nothing had happened, no one actually paid attention to it. And I am actually uh, hopeful about this because it means that the, the whistleblowers are usually not staying completely silent. They are trying to tell someone there is something bad happening, but they are not using the proper channels. And from my point of view, from po the point of view of communication is to give them uh, more reasons to actually look for the proper channels and to risk their job, uh, risk their livelihood uh, for the better of the society. Interesting part is also that uh, one fifth of the whistleblowers stay completely silent. They are not telling to anyone. And the two biggest reasons they have given are that they are skeptical that nothing will happen, which is actually a legitimate, legitimate legit thing to say. And uh, another big group of people who are staying silent are staying silent because they are afraid of losing the job. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem is that uh, term visible is unknown to Czech people. I think uh, it will be the same in uh, other regions of the Visegrad, uh, Visegrad countries. But 
if you explain them what the person is doing, they will first associate it like, oh yeah, you mean like st stew pigeon or a snitch. Uh, I think it could be because of the communist history of uh, Czech Republic, uh, because someone who is like going to police and telling on his neighbor or, or his employer is like doing the bad stuff. Uh, so there are negative connotations or... Show actually a specific example. You will tell people the story like there is Miss Eva, she was working for the city and she found out that the city is actually defrauding money. Uh, people will start to see her more and more positively. So, what's uh, I think the most important thing, and uh, I want you to actually take from this presentation. Sure. If you want if you want people to see the whistleblowing as something legitimate, important, uh, tell them the stories and focus on consequences of the behavior that uh, whistleblower is uh, helping to stop. Uh, the reason why I'm so uh, invested in the communication of these stories, uh, I have two reasons. Uh, we want more people to actually report the crimes. We want more people to see it's important to actually go to some personal risk to actually do something good for others. And there is strong feeling of people that they would like to be doing that, but they have some pro uh, they have obstacles to conclude. And one of the optic obstacles is uh, that the society, if they are not willing to support whistleblowers, it's much easier to uh, punish the whistleblower, to take them out of the job, and to uh, treat them badly. So if we will be able to communicate uh, the positively this topic, I think it will be good for the whole whistleblowing community. Okay. And it takes me to another thing, the perfect story. We have, we have focused on this uh, in our research uh, and, we and we have tried to ask people in different ways about different um, stories of the from the praxis of our company or from what happened in Czech Republic and we have found out that they are usually not very interested in the person of a whistleblower uh, they don't remember them they usually don't remember the name they usually remember it oh it's the lady that actually said that some hospital <laughs> we are losing you a little bit Let's try it. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, Sorry. So the consequences and the results, that is the most important thing you can, uh, you can look for in the stories. Be, and uh, the explanation is uh, simple. I think you all understand. The thing is that uh, people are not uh, very well to understand the legal part of the story, but they can but they can understand the... Yeah, I see, I hear someone in, in my audio. Okay, I will continue. continue, please. Yeah. So uh, if you will be able to explain the problem that uh, the whistleblower is actually talking about in the consequences of that, let's say, crime or something illegal happening, uh, people will listen and they will support it. The second thing uh, to support uh, whistleblowers is to actually show the stories where the whistleblower is, uh, you know, he's okay now. Because when people see that uh, it's not really good for you personally, when you go to report some crimes and then you will end up uh, thrown out of your job, for example, they obviously don't want to go also. But it's also important that when you have like a happy, a, a good ending for the, for the story, it also makes you look better in the eyes of public as a whistleblower. So if you end it well, people believe that you have been doing something good. And another interesting part is that uh, people want the story to has an end. Basically, if you will just tell them something bad was happening and someone uh, thought is happening, it's not enough. Uh, you have to tell them then like what happened to the criminals, what happened to the guy who reported it. 
And I have two uh, interesting topics for you uh, that you should focus on, and that's environment and health. Uh, their obvious communication um, like advantage is that if you talk about health issue, people do not need you to actually show them the consequences because they are able to think about them themselves. So they see the importance of the topic for themselves. And the same goes for the environment. So it means that these topics are easier to communicate. And they are, if you would be planning, for example, to do a campaign in your country to actually support whistleblowing, I think these two topics would be like safe bets to focus on if you will be doing that. And I think this is basically the end of the presentation. I will be happy to answer obvious any questions. And I will summarize that many people have encountered unethical behavior. Or are sure about it, but half of the population thinks that something fishy is going on in their companies or you know bureaus and stuff. Uh, they do not understand whistleblowing. Obviously, it's a foreign word for them, and they do not understand it on a legal or general level. But they can understand it on a concrete examples very well, and then see and they see it as a positive thing if it's presented that way. They are skeptical, afraid, and shift responsibility. That's are the main reasons why why are people not reporting. They are skeptical, which means that they think nothing will change. So why should I risk it? They are afraid because they see that if they will try to do something, there could be some kind of revenge. And what's another interesting for me was they are shifting responsibility. So you can hear them to say something like, you know, it's not my job to actually uh, do this legal stuff. It should be my boss's job or it should be someone else's job. Or they say, I was just following orders. I don't care. I don't, I'm not responsible because I have to, you know, follow the orders. Um, and in all of these problems, uh, examples help. Examples, examples, consequences, consequences. That's what you should remember. And good examples would have a good ending. They would show the consequences and they should be about health or environment. And that is all from me. And this is my email. And if you would like to write me, if you would like to connect with uh, our company, we are focused like for 20 years, we are doing corruption and whistleblowing basically in Czech Republic. So we will be happy to answer anything you need. That's all from me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Valvozovsky. Really interesting. Now we have heard about the history of the uh, of the uh, and the attempts to regulate whistleblowing in in Czech Republic about the present situation uh, in legal matter and uh, how the whistleblower protection is seen by by public uh, in Czech Republic and now we will have to leave Czech Republic and we are moving to Hungary i would like to ask professor Attila Kuhn to to uh, share the presentation with us and before that please let me to introduce Professor Kuhn, but I, it, it should take uh, a lot of time because it's it's a lot of a lot of uh, I, that's much to say about Professor Kuhn, but only a few things. Uh, professor Kuhn is professor at the and the head of the Department of Labor Law and Social Security at the Karoli Gasper University of the Reformed Church in Hungary. He's also the member of the Hungarian Acad Academy of Science. He's visiting, he has been visiting scholar at number, numerous foreign universities. He is a member of several academic networks and he holds the Marco Biagi Prize for 2011. So we are really happy to have you with us, Professor Kuhn. And uh, we are happy to hear how the situation is in Hungary regarding the whistleblower protection, please. Hello, good but morning. We, can, we cannot see your presentation yet, unfortunately. Uh... I shared it already. Uh, 
the present okay now it's now we can see it we can see it's okay uh, okay okay thank, thank you. you very much uh, uh good morning to everyone of course it's needless to say it's a great pleasure to be part of this project and uh thank you very much again for the organizers especially dagmara for organizing this project and also the conference of course uh it's also needless to say it would be much better to be together in prague <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. during this day but uh let's cope with this situation somehow Okay, I would like to briefly present the Hungarian uh, current situation of whistleblowing, and I would like to focus on uh, four uh, main topics. First, I would like to sketch the legal background, a little bit of history. Uh, second, I would like to focus on the main uh, shortcomings and flaws of the current, currently effective uh, regulation. Uh, third, I would like to focus on internal whistleblowing. I'm a labor lawyer, and uh, during the afternoon, my dear colleagues from the Ombudsman's office uh, will talk about uh, external whistleblowing. So I think we can do a good match because I will focus on the internal aspects. And fourth, uh, I will uh, say something uh, about the labor law aspects of the story. So let's start with the legal background. In Hungary, so far, we have had uh, four, uh, three uh, whistleblowing laws. The first one is dating back to 1977. So it was uh, in the spirit of the social, socialist, socialist morals still. Um, and this law was uh, in effect, uh, was in force till Hungary's uh, accession to the EU, so till 2004. Of course, it was not really effective. And as I said, it was based on the socialist idea of uh, report reporting fraud and uh, stuff like that, but it already contained some forward looking uh, elements and some basic pillars and principles of whistleblowing protection. But of course, as I mentioned very formally and uh, in practice, it was not really uh, effective. The second piece of uh, legislation, which is interesting, of course, between 2004 and 2006, we also had uh, some rules in force, but uh, in 2006, there was a new separate law, which was called uh, the protection of fair procedure and so on. And this was a very interesting piece of legislation. Although it was totally detached from reality, it was like flying in the air. So it was in force for four years. Uh, but it was not uh, effective again. It was mostly a law on paper and not in action because this law intended to establish a specific designated authority agency uh, to increase the efficiency in combating corruption. But finally, this never happened. So this authority has never been um, established. So this um, law was totally uh, ineffective. Although again, on paper, it had some really progressive features, especially compared to the currently effective uh, act. Uh, I will come back to that because it was uh, dealing with uh, incentivizing the whistleblower. For example, it foresaw 10% uh, kind of fee, kind of reward uh, for the whistleblower. So it was kind of uh, progressive. Uh, also, it was dealing with the full publicization of uh, decisions after uh, examination of uh, public interest disclosure. So it was, again, kind of progressive. And it also contained very detailed, very specific rules on the protection of the whistleblower, what we cur currently don't really have, as I will come back to it. As you may know, uh, in Hungary, we have a government in force for uh, more than 10 years now. And uh, after this government came into force uh, in 2010, uh, also the fundamental law, the Hungarian constitution, we say it, the fundamental law, a new fundamental law was accepted. And I don't want to go into details, but the right of petition was uh, confirmed uh, in the new fundamental law. So this is kind of the starting point, the basic pillar of whistleblowing protection. And we have this new law. I will refer to this new law from 2013 uh, in the future, like CPID, because it's about complaints and public interest disclosures. So it's a specific law on complaints and um, public interest disclosure. That's how we call uh, whistleblowing in the Hungarian terminology. And this law is dealing with both internal and external whistleblowing. And as I mentioned, I will mostly focus on internal, uh, on the internal aspects as my dear colleagues from the Ombudsman office uh, during the afternoon will talk about uh, the Ombudsman's role as the main external protected channel of whistleblowing. 
I have to mention very briefly a fourth uh, interesting development in the history, brief history of Hungarian uh, regulation of whistleblowing. In 2015 and 16, the government formulated concrete plans for a new law. I know, uh, and it's downloadable on the internet, two uh, versions of the text. Uh, it was a very detailed draft. Uh, it was part of the uh, overarching anti-corruption program of the government at that time, but finally, no one knows why, especially, <laughs> at least I don't know why. Uh, so it was kind of mysterious, but it completely disappeared uh, from the political agenda. Uh, it could have been very interesting because it would have merged the advantages of the 2090 and the 2013 law. But uh, as I mentioned, it completely disappeared uh, from the political discussions. But you can see a quote uh, on my slide. And this quote is from the official reasoning of this uh, uh, draft uh, law, and it was quite telling and revealing that uh, in the official reasoning uh, of this, uh, it's not official because it was not adopted, but uh, the original reasoning of this law, the Hungarian government recognized the shortcomings of the current rules of public interest whistleblowers protection, and also the government kind of acknowledged uh, the ineffectiveness of the current system. Uh, because it was also criticized by the European semester's uh, report on the Hungarian economic, economic environment. So uh, it, was, it could have been a good starting point for adopting a new law, uh, but uh, of course it uh, did not happen. So let me come to my second topic. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the currently effective law, the CPID. And as I don't have much time to, to present and describe the law in details, I would like to focus on some critical points and some debated aspects of the currently effective law. Of course, these critics are mostly formulated by NGOs, academics, experts, so there are not much political discussions uh, currently on this uh, topic. And the um, opinions of NGOs are sometimes, of course, very relevant and very up to the point, but sometimes uh, are also over politicized so we have to uh, take them and deal with them with a little bit of caution. But let me just highlight some of the most uh, uh, interesting failures of the current regulation. First, the current regulations clearly lack sp specific targeted remedies for victimized whistleblowers. Of course, there is a clause in the law uh, about remedies, but it is very general and the right to be reinstated or compensated, for example, from a labor law point of view, uh, it's only dealt with uh, according to the general labor law provisions. And again, I don't have time to go into the specificities of Hungarian labor law, but reinstatement in general, not only uh, in terms of whistleblowing, but in general is very exceptional uh, in Hungarian labor law after unjustified dismissal. And also the compensation is very limited. So it's a problem also in the context of whistleblowing that that there are no specific targeted remedies. The second big problem that, of course, the currently effective law, the CPID, has a general ban on retaliation, a general clause, but again, uh, the law lacks the specific means to protect whistleblowers from reprisals and criminal prosecutions and civil actions. For example, in practice, according to practicing lawyers, it's quite often that the, against the whistleblower, um, a civil action is starting, for example, for moral damages uh, or for breaching the uh, confidentiality or even a criminal prosecution for defamation. And this is not clearly uh, protected uh, by the law because detrimental measures against the whistleblower can only be justified if the misconduct is proven. But uh, in case of suspicion of wrongdoing, it only suspicion of wrongdoing, this uh, protection is not uh, prevailing or at least it's not legally clear. So there are many problems with this in practice. Uh, let me mention some uh, other uh, relevant critics of the current regulation. Uh, it also mentioned often by NGOs that the current law does not provide a full range of disclosure channels because, for example, turning to the media is not dealt with uh, in the uh, current law. Um, this is also a problem. And what is also a problem that from a labor law point of view, um, the current law does not require workplace retaliation and harassment to be investigated and remedied. I mean that, of course, uh, 
Um, there are general clauses to do that, but there are no specific procedural rules and specific guarantees in the law for such uh, reason. There are many uh, critics and uh, points for discussion. I don't go with details with all of that. Uh, let me just mention maybe one or two uh, more of them. It's also often raised that the law only provides a formal way of appeal. I'm talking about external uh, whistleblowing now, uh, which is dealt by the Ombudsman Office, basically, as a main channel. But the Ombudsman Office has neither the empowerment, the authorization, nor the capacities and the resources to conduct substantive investigations. So maybe my uh, colleagues uh, from the Ombudsman Office will reflect on this, but it's a general opinion of many uh, academics and NGOs that, uh, of course, it's very nice to have this protected channel of external whistleblowing at the Ombudsman Office, but uh, uh, the substantive investigations are quite um, uh, limited uh, in effect. Um, NGOs are also often raising that relatives of whistleblowers are not protected un under Hungarian law. I don't see this as the most important problem, but uh, we can mention this. So as a conclusion of this part, uh, NGOs often come to the conclusion, as you can see a small quote on my slide, uh, there was a submission from some Hungarian NGOs to the UN special reporter on the right to freedom and of opinion and expression about the whistleblowing law. And the Hungarian NGOs concluded that the current law does not provide sufficient protection to whistleblowers and has to be reshaped fundamentally. So maybe the directive could be a good impetus for this uh, revision. Um, if I come to, um, uh, if I'm, I'm leaving aside this uh, NGO critics and I am coming to the text of the law more specifically, um, let me just raise some problems. Uh, the first one uh, is section 11 of the uh, CPID, which says that any disadvantage to the whistleblower shall be unlawful, even if it would be otherwise lawful. So seemingly, it's a very, very strong uh, general clause for protection of whistleblowers. But in effect, it's kind of an empty box, an empty shell, because uh, it's more like a declaration. So we don't have specific supporting rules for that sake. So in my view, this is one of the biggest problems. The second problem what I would like to identify connected to section 12, uh, as you can see on the slide uh, to the CPID, that there is a chance, according to the law, uh, that the uh, whistleblower at risk uh, could be identified. Uh, but the problem is that it is not defined by the law that who is competent uh, to classify the the given whistleblower as specifically at risk or being endangered in his or her life circumstances. So it's again kind of an empty rule uh, in the currently effective regulation. And the last um, such point, uh, the law says that the minister responsible shall issue a decree about the aids available for whistleblowers, but no such regulation in, is enforced in Hungary for seven years now uh, since the adoption of this new law. So this is again a big uh, black hole uh, in the regulation. Let me come very briefly to internal whistleblowing. The general uh, opinion of experts in Hungary, uh, let me quote uh, one of my dear colleagues that the standards for combating corporate wrongdoing in Hungarian-owned companies do not correspond to international norms. If we see the statistics, uh, according to one statistics, one recent survey, uh, only 53, 54% of uh, Hungarian corporate corporations do have some kind of uh, codes of ethics or ethical infrastructure, and even less, about 28% do have some kind of dedicated channel, ethical hotline or whistleblowing hotline. Like globally, this index is around 60%. So we are lagging behind. And the CPID is very soft uh, in terms of internal whistleblowing because the CPID allows organizations, companies to formulate distinct codes of conduct and the rules for procedures for public interest disclosures and also allows companies to enter into agency contracts with lawyers, with attorneys uh, for the sake of protection of disclosure, disclosures. This is the kind of the German model, uh, this uh, how we call it, disclosure protection lawyer. Um, 
So there is a possibility for companies, uh, apart from having their own uh, reporting system, to have a private agency contract, a kind of outsourced private contractual ombudsman, internal ombudsman, internal or external partly because it's a lawyer. So there is this possibility, but I am also the member of the Budapest Bar Association, and there are, according to my knowledge, only three such lawyers in Budapest. So you can imagine that this is quite uh, a low uh, number. Uh, so uh, internal whistleblowing is not obligatory. Uh, it's only an option for companies, but if companies uh, do decide to set up such a system, they must comply with the law, which means that basically they have to give very detailed information publicly uh, on the website on the company. But if we check the big Hungarian multinationals, of course, we can find some um, information, but it's really not um, effective and not widespread. And as I mentioned before, there are no specific legal guarantees prescribed in the law for internal investigations. So it often very ha it happens quite often that the investigations are carried out by those who are also at the same time the subject uh, of the uh, investigation. Very briefly, let me come to the labor law aspect. Uh, four very brief remarks I would like to uh, express uh, in the following maybe two minutes. Um, the first problem from a labor lawyer's perspective, uh, the burden of proof, as it was uh, mentioned by some of my colleagues already. Uh, the burden of proof is not clarified uh, in the CPID. Of course, by way of legal interpretation, we can come to a, a correct conclusion. But uh, in my opinion, and also in the opinion of the uh, draft law from 2005, uh, it should be written in the law that the employer is the one who shall prove that uh, his or her action, typically the unjustified dismissal, is not related to the uh, disclosure, to the public interest disclosure, so it would be clarified this point. The second topic, the role of workers' representatives, as it was uh, tackled in the first uh, panel, Again, it's not clarified. Uh, we have a general labor law rule that uh, the works council uh, should be consulted prior to passing any internal regulations uh, affecting a large number of employees, including protection of personal data. But again, this uh, rule is very shaky and not specific to whistleblowing. So it would be nice to clarify uh, this also. The third important labor law topic is about confidentiality. Uh, as again, many of you have mentioned, uh, also in Hungarian labor law, we have a very strict general rule uh, on confidentiality in terms of business secrets and other uh, employment related information. And the problem, technically speaking, that the CPID does not clearly set aside this duty. So again, we can have some uh, cre creative interpretation, but it would be nice to make it clear that uh, if uh, someone is doing a good faith reporting, uh, confidentiality should be uh, uh, in the background. And the last uh, labor law remark, labor law related remark, that uh, in my view, uh, there would be need for specific targeted information, transparent information uh, for workers about whistleblowing uh, opportunities in a company and uh, maybe not only information but specific drivers and deflector mechanisms would be nice because as experts are saying even the best constructed whistleblowing system will remain ineffective it is not really used by employees and this is the case in Hungary so not many employees are using uh, such uh, systems even if they do exist. I am already coming to the end of my presentation, but let me just very briefly mention uh, a very interesting new decision of the uh, Hungarian National Authority for Data Protection and Freedom of Information. And I'm happy to see that the uh, head of this department is among the participants uh, of this conference. Uh, so uh, it's a big pleasure and um, honor for us to have him with us. And uh, this uh, new decision, and according to my knowledge, this is the first and only decision based on the GDPR connected to uh, whistleblowing. It was about a local government. The local government um, maintained and um, 
supervised an institution, school, and uh, an employee from this school lodged a complaint directly uh, against the employer to the local government. And during the procedure, accidentally, the local government revealed the complainants, the employee's name to the uh, institution. And as you can imagine, the institution uh, fired uh, the employee. And uh, finally, the uh, authority imposed the fine of 3,000 euro very recently on this local government. But this uh, decision is kind of telling to me as a labor lawyer, because it's interesting to see that uh, the remedy is coming from uh, the GDPR, coming from data protection law and not from labor law. And this is also good from uh, the perspective of the GDPR, but not really good uh, in terms of uh, labor law. And the last conclusion, maybe very briefly, um, as you can see, the currently effective regulation, the CPID, is not as detailed and not as specific as the directive. So we can estimate that there will be a need for a rather large or at least medium-sized amendment, amendment to the law. I'm not saying that this is the only way uh, to uh, get in conformity with the directive, but uh, most probably that's what uh, uh, will happen. I mean that the amendment of the currently effective law and uh, it should involve dozens of provisions uh, clearly. But the problem, uh, and let me be a bit critical on that point, that based on the general experience of Hungarian um, legal harmonization and implementation of EU laws, it is very unlikely that any draft or concept or social consultation would take place before 2021 or even uh, the spring of 2021. Maybe I'm a bit pessimistic and it would be very nice to see uh, a wide discussion and debate on this topic. Um, we will see. But on the other hand, it's maybe uh, also kind of special because so far as you saw, we had very big plans, very big ideas, like in 2006, but uh, the effect was very minimal. So maybe now we are dealing with a different situation because we don't really have big plans and the consultation is not really going on, but maybe uh, the end result uh, could be satisfactory. Uh, maybe I'm too optimistic, but let's see how it comes. Thanks again uh, for your attention and uh, I'm finishing now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Kuhn, for really interesting presentation and for insight into the Hungarian situation. And now we are going to move to the Polish situation. I hope that Professor Skupien is with us. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't think that I need a lot of, uh, uh, to need a lot of uh, explanation who Professor Skupien is, but uh, nevertheless, she is the one who is responsible that we are here today. And she's the coordinator of the project of the whistleblower protection, but uh, otherwise uh, she is the professor at the University of Łódź, Faculty of Law and Administration, and as well barrister at the bar of Łódź. She's author of many monographs and other publications in publish, and, uh, pub publications in Polish and European labor law, member of the European Trade Union Institutes, uh, and uh, much more. So I'm really happy that uh, she is our coordinator and that I can give her the floor now. Please, Dagmara. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now I'm taking uh, my uh, role of uh, showing, explaining how the whistleblower protection in Poland is uh, guaranteed uh, right now. Poland does not have uh, a single legal act concerning whistleblowing, uh, despite efforts uh, of um, non-governmental organizations uh, who have prepared such bill, despite one bill um, from government, which was finally not uh, adopted. But that uh, this thing does not mean that whistleblowers are not guaranteed any protection in our country. So um, I would like to firstly point that the very essence of the uh, right to whistleblowing lies with the freedom of expression and uh, this right has been guaranteed in international conventions ratified by Poland starting from International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of the United Nations, then regional conventions certainly, Article 10 
European Convention of Human Rights and the freedom of speech is also guaranteed in the Constitution and further developed in the Press Act. Then um, the whistleblowing uh, protection rules developed um, with uh, the efforts to fight uh, negative um, acts such as corruption and um, other infringements uh, of law in different sectors. So uh, we ratified certain conventions concerning fighting corruption. Uh, then the development of um, European Union law uh, has certainly forced the Polish legislator to um, adapt Polish legislation to sector-specific uh, acts, such as, for example, market abuse regulation, to implement various multiple uh, sector-specific directives. And also, what is very important, uh, there was an implementation of uh, trade secrets uh, directive of uh, 2016. When I was uh, listening to the presentation of Professor Daria Stenczur Pecek, I understood that we may also uh, distinguish Polish rules, uh, sectoral specific rules on whistleblowing and general rules resulting from the uh, labor code. Of course, uh, problems of anonymity uh, regulated in various acts, and I also would, try, would like to draw your attention to the Code of Criminal Proceedings as a source of right to be an anonymous uh, witness in the criminal uh, proceedings. Certainly, um, in public sector, um, there are efforts uh, to, to fight um, corruption, abuse of powers, um, fraud of public funds. Therefore, uh, there are many codes of professional deontology uh, and also codes of ethics. Codes of ethics, for example, adopted in local governments. And as it concerns codes of professional deontology, for example, codes for policemen or public prosecutors, we may find there such clauses as obligations to react, not to tolerate, not to neglect breaches of law or of ethical principles by, uh, by colleagues. Um, private sector, <laughs> certainly very much... Uh, voluntarity right now, but we may observe the development of internal regulations of enterprises, codes of ethics, and also um, procedures uh, which are required by compliance with uh, sector uh, specific uh, requirements. Well, the consequence that we do not have one single legal act is also that we do not have a general legal definition of a whistleblower. Uh, however, uh, we may address ourselves uh, to recommendation of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, uh, where the definition was um, provi provided for. And uh, certainly Polish legislation um, has to adopt the definition uh, from the European Union uh, whistleblowing directive, which has to be implemented by December next year. Material scope, um, even though there is no single catalog of breaches uh, which would give right to protection, there are certainly catalogs resulting from uh, sector specific acts. So we may uh, cite as an example here, um, catalog of breaches uh, in the area uh, of uh, banking. So uh, this catalog covers not only infringements of law, but also infringements of procedures and standards of ethics at a given bank or in publicly traded companies where uh, there should be channels for reporting not only uh, legal provisions, not only breaches of, of, of law on public offering and um, EU prospectus regulation, but also reporting uh, of breaches of procedures and standards of ethics in publicly traded companies. There is no consent in the uh, Polish doctrine of labor law if whistleblowing uh, is a duty of an employee or his or her right. However, in public sector, there are 
stronger oblig obligations expressly uh, indicated uh, as it um, concerns employees of state administration offices, so the duty to protect the interests of the state, uh, self-government employees to take care of public interests and uh, civil servants to serve the interests of the Polish state. I would also uh, would like to draw your attention to um, obligations concerning um, disclosing uh, criminal offenses. So any state or self-government institution which within the framework of uh, its actions uh, got information about the criminal offense is obliged to uh, disclose this fact to the police or the public prosecutor's office. So this obligation relies on persons who have managerial or controlling uh, duties. And also every citizen uh, has the obligation to inform the prosecutor's office or the police about the criminal office, which is to be pursued by the public prosecutor. And this obligation is legally enforceable in case of, uh, of the crimes, um, of the most serious crimes. Then um, what is interesting uh, enough, for example, the ILO Convention Concerning Health and uh, Safety at Mines, uh, which was uh, also ratified by Poland, obliges minors to report about any irregularities concerning their workplace. And for example, um, entities required by the Polish law on preventing money laundering and terrorism financing are obliged to report on money laundering and terrorist financing. And there are also sanctions in case um, of non-compliance with this duty. Now, as it concerns employees, uh, Article 100 of the Labor Code, Paragraph 2, uh, which I would like to cite here, describes the employee's obligations. So firstly, to take care for the good of the employing establishment to protect its property, which itself may be uh, a source of right to whistleblowing to maintain the confidentiality of information, the disclosure of which could cause damage to the employer. So here there may be controversies, there may be disputes if, um, if the employee is in breach of this uh, obligation of confidentiality. And also the, um, the employee certainly is obliged by different provisions to maintain the confidentiality concerning different professions, medical doctors, for example, barristers, uh, legal advisors, etc. Then employee has to observe the principles of social coexistence at the employ employing establishment. So um, there are multiple disputes uh, between employees who sometimes may be formulate hastily, too hastily negative opinions, negative criticisms about employers. And in many cases, such situations uh, led to disciplinary dismissal, namely dismissal with notice, or um, dismiss, dis disciplinary or dismissal with, with notice in case of, um, of the alleged breach of employees' obligations. I would like to explain here that as it concerns the disciplinary dismissal of an employee, namely dismissal for the serious breach of employees' duties without a notice period, the control of the valid grounds uh, for such a dismissal by labor courts concerns all types of contracts, of employment contracts, yes. But uh, in case of dismissals with notice, the judicial control of a valid ground for such a dismissal concerns only open-ended contracts. So this is the first weakness of our labor law here detected. On the other hand, there are persons who are more safe as a whistleblower because they are guaranteed special protection against dismissals. This is for different groups related with maternity, for example, but also trade union officials, works councils members, European works council members, or board level employee representatives in public companies. So on the basis of a 
abandoned case law and dismissal cases concerning the permissible or not permitted character of a public criticism about the employer by the employee. We may conclude here that a permitted and constructive criticism by the employee, according to the Supreme Court judgments, does not only violate, but it's a sign of care for the good of the employer the fulfillment of his duty, yes, to, to take care for the good of the employer. However, there are conditions which have to be met according to the case law uh, of the Supreme Court, namely this criticism should be substantive, reliable, adequate to specific factual circumstances, presented in the appropriate form, not insultive, done in good faith, namely this control of good faith, this is a check if an employee acted with his, her subjective belief that he or she based his, her criticism on truthful facts. So here the, the courts require due diligence in, 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 in checking this, these facts. And also uh, this person should act in the justified interest of the employer. So if I may cite here uh, the case law of the Supreme Court, retaliatory actions taken by the employer in case the criticism is permitted, is constructive, may be qualified uh, as a serious breach of basic obligations of the employer towards the employee, thus entitling the employee to um, resolve the employment contract without notice for the fault of the employer. So I think uh, the Supreme Court really developed a very, very important case law uh, in protection of whistleblowers. Now, I would like to draw your attention to the possible conflict uh, of whistleblowing acts of disclosures with the obligation uh, to keep confidential trade secrets of the employer. So certainly there may arise a dispute uh, on this issue. And um, if I would like to refer to the um, Act on Combating Unfair Competition, which was uh, adapted uh, to the European Union Trade Secrets Directive of 2016, there is an exception uh, formulated in Article 11, Paragraph 8 of this Act, stating that disclosure, use, or acquisition of information that constitutes a trade secret is not an act of unfair competition with all the consequences, um, civil and criminal consequences, when it has occurred to protect the legitimate interest protected by law as part of exercising one's freedom of expression or to disclose irregularities, misconduct, actions in breach of law to protect the public interest or when disclosure of information constituting a trade secret to employees representatives in the performance of a function under the law was necessary for the proper performance of those functions. Uh, so far, this exception was not analyzed by the case law, but it's important to underline that this exception uh, is introduced to the Polish law and is in favor of, of whistleblowers. As it concerns anti-discrimination rules. So um, in uh, implementing uh, Polish obligations resulting from the anti-discrimination directives from, the, uh, from 2000, we have uh, provisions concerning anti-discrimination in the labor code. But if you look closely at the catalog of criteria, there's a use of a term in particular preceding the catalog of criteria um, assimilating to the catalog of the EU directives of 2000. Uh, moreover, membership in a trade union. Uh, so um, now um, there is no consent in the doctrine if this catalog is fully open or it is semi-open. And I would like to draw your attention to the Court of Just uh, to the Supreme Court uh, case law, namely the judgment of 2012, which um, stated that even though this catalog 
is open, is not restricted to the indicated criteria. Uh, it should be enlarged only to other reasons, uh, to other characteristics or properties which concern a given victim of discrimination personally and are relevant from the social point of view. So I think that, um, or for the reason of employment for a fixed term or for an indefinite period of time, employment for a part-time or full-time employment, which uh, what reflects the directives concerning atypical, atypical work. So I think that um, still there are doubts if whistleblowing uh, would be this additional criterion, additional characteristic or property of an employee which concerns him, her, or per personally. And therefore, uh, it is not clear, it was not judged by the Court of Justice if the reversal of burden of proof in discrimination cases could, could apply to, to, an, to a whistleblower. Certainly, um, the situation of whistleblowers employed under a civil law contract is more difficult because there is no protection under labor law. As it concerns the Equality Act of 2010, which concerns uh, civil law contract employed persons, this law has a closed catalog of discrimination criteria. Anyway, uh, Whistleblowers employed under a civil law contract uh, may always sue for compensation for the damages resulting from a breach of the contract according to the civil law provisions and the contract's clauses. Uh, as it concerns now different, uh, different procedures, uh, different uh, channels, so for the majority of entities, uh, internal reporting is voluntary, except uh, certain sectors like banks, like uh, public traded companies, for example, and entities required to prevent money laundering and terrorist financing. So these uh, reporting channels uh, are regulated separately uh, in relation to these specific sectors. As it concerns external whistleblowing, the problem is that certainly there is no centrally organized guidance or information uh, which is the correct prescribed body for whistleblowing in a giver issue. There are multiple institutions, bodies, where a person may refer to, may disclose, of course, there are different rules on anonymity as it concerns different prescribed uh, bodies. Uh, here, a very important step uh, in creating, a, let's say, a pattern maybe for an external whistleblowing. This is a dedicated channel to report uh, money laundering and terrorism financing to the institution of a general inspector of financial information. So uh, this channel is... Um, specially dedicated to, to whistleblowing on this issue. Uh, it is open for a larger personal scope of whistleblowers. There is a guarantee of confidentiality, of protection of personal data. And what is also important, there is a deadline for giving information on follow-up measures. Public whistleblowing uh, certainly uh, has its roots in the freedom of expression. There is no precedence of internal or external channels of reporting before public whistleblowing. Uh, public whistleblowing increased during the COVID-19 epidemic with people disclosing irregularities in the healthcare system. But um, there are some, some professional rules which may hamper, which may be a barrier for public whistleblowing. So I would like to draw your attention to the code of medical ethics, where uh, it is stated that a physician should display particular caution in formulating opinions about professional conduct of another doctor and all comments on the observed uh, wrongful conduct of a physician should be in the first place pass on to him or her. So in the second place, if the intervention appears to be uh, inefficient, um, 
or there's a continuation of a wrongful conduct, then maybe um, a disclosure to the appropriate organ of a medical chamber. Even though these rules have already been changed due to the uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights, I think that still this wording blocks public whistleblowing uh, as it concerns medical doctors and the similar provisions may be found in the code uh, for uh, nurses. Of course, public whistleblower may encounter different risks, civil liability for the breach of confidentiality, for the infringement of personal goods of the employer, such a good reputation. Uh, he or she may um, be submitted to disciplinary proceedings uh, in certain professions. We may also note here criminal liability for defamation, for the breach of state secrets, for the breach of confidentiality, and maybe some other sanctions which have a chill effect on, on public whistleblowing. So how to assess the current situation? There is certainly a dispersion of provisions concerning the protection of whistleblowers, no legal definition of a whistleblower, no single catalog of acts. Employees uh, have protection of against uh, in case of dismissal. But uh, of course, even though there are people who are specially protected in case of whistleblowing, such as trade union officials, employee representatives, and there is a strong position of persons employed uh, on the basis of open-ended contracts, there's a weaker level of protection against reprisals for fixed term contracts and persons employed on other basis than the employment contract. So far, no duty of enterprises to set up internal reporting channels except in certain sectors and no clarity as to the correct prescribed body. So our conclusion has to be there's a need to adopt one single act on whistleblower protection. However, we have to reflect how to arrange this new single act with so far existing sectoral specific various legal acts which also offer protection. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Skupien for her very interesting uh, presentation. And now we are coming to our last speaker in this panel, to the Dr. Veronika Zurichakova. Is, I hope you're with us. Yes, I can see you. Uh, Dr. Zurichakova is coming from the uh, Ternova University in uh, uh, and she is from, from Slovakia and uh, she is uh, working at the Department of Labor Law and Social Security Law. She has completed her doctoral studies at that department with thesis, restitution after termination and invalidity of contracts. And she's also dealing with the issues of non-contractual obligations, unjustified enrichment and liability. So uh, I would like to give you the floor and we are happy to hear about the Slovak whistleblowing regulation uh, after revision. The floor is thank yours. You thank you very much. Uh, but firstly, let me thank you. Thank you to Dr. Skupin and also to her team for this invitation and for the opportunity to be part of this uh, wonderful project. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, please, uh, let me greet all of you, all of the participants on the behalf of uh, Trnava University and Trnava Faculty of Law. Uh, so let me please briefly uh, introduce you with our Slo Slovak legal frame framework of whistleblowing regulation. Uh, first of all, uh, it is to be said that in the Slovak legal uh, legal sphere or, or in Slovak legal, legal framework, we have this special act regulating the protection of whistleblowers. Uh, it is a uh, quite a new act uh, from the year of 2019. Um, and uh, it is to be said that after more than uh, one and a half of the year of effectiveness of this act, it is not yet fully implemented, uh, which is quite a shame because uh, we, uh, this is the second, I think, or the third act even uh, that is specialized on the issue of whistleblowing. Uh, as you all already know, uh, the issue of whistleblowing reaches into more than one field of law. Um, it is, you know, the issue uh, of labor law, but it also reaches into criminal law and administrative law. So please uh, let me a few words uh, to each and every one of these fields. Uh, 
Uh, as, to the come, as it comes to the labor law, uh, we have in Slovakia our labor code. Uh, in the labor code of Slovak Republic, there is uh, only a general prohibition of discrimination uh, stated or stipulated, uh, which also kind of, um, uh, it's also applicable to whistleblowers. Uh, because uh, in this general prohibition of discrimination uh, directly is applicable to, to employees who report an, uh, any antisocial activities. Uh, also in the labor code of the public, there is a form formulated and a general obligation to respect good manners. Uh, but other than that, uh, other, other from these, uh, do these two uh, general obligations and prohibitions, there are no actually other more specific, more detailed uh, regulation, uh, which is particularly applicable to whistleblowing in our legal sphere. Um, it is uh, to be mentioned that apart from our labor code, we have also uh, another two specialized acts. The first is act on state service and the second is act on performance of work in public interest. Um, oh, of course, these acts are specific, specifically applicable to uh, state employees and the employees working in the public sector, or for example, people working in uh, say, hospitals, first aids, etc., etc. Um, although there's um, a particular uh, specialized regulation uh, regarding uh, the reporting of antisocial activities, uh, it is not uh, at all sufficient. But it doesn't have to be because, uh, as already was said, we have this special act on the protection of whistleblowers. And this act is fully applicable, not only uh, on the employers and employees um, uh, under the labor code system, but also on the state and the public employees that uh, their position is uh, primarily, primarily regulated by these two special acts. So the act on the state service and the act on performance of work in public interest. Uh, when it comes to criminal law, uh, our criminal code uh, has only a minor, uh, minor uh, regulatory framework, which is applicable to a whistleblowing issue. Uh, first of all, uh, there's um, uh, two, uh, two uh, very concrete criminal offenses that are directly applicable. First of all, a failure to report a crime, but also a failure to prevent a crime is considered a criminal offense in our, uh, in our legal system. And what does it mean? Not, uh, uh, not any failure to report and prevent any crime, but uh, it is all only a crime of corruption, first of all, and then a, corrupt, uh, and then a crime of uh, higher intensity of unlawfulness, I would say, is uh, criminally punishable in our, in our uh, legal sphere. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, even though uh, the act uh, on a protection of whistleblowers doesn't uh, doesn't um, doesn't mention or doesn't state doesn't stipulate any a particular obligation to blow a whistle, but if you read our criminal code and if you read that you can be prosecuted or even uh, convicted uh, uh, because you did not report it and you did not prevent it uh, a crime of a corruption, then it is to be said that there is in fact in our slow legal framework an obligation to blow a whistle. Uh, as uh, it comes to the administrative law, we have a special act on complaints, but uh, this um, this application is rather rather limited when it comes to scope of application, uh, because it is applicable only to public institutions and not to private entities. Uh, first of all, and second of all, uh, this uh, specialized act on complaints uh, is rather a procedural act. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have this material scope of application that it is really needed to to be uh, when it comes to whistleblowers and their their status and their uh, their uh, their protection. And uh, last but not least, we have the civil law and the, uh, again, general construction of the right to the protection of personality, life, health, civil honor, nevertheless, and human dignity. Uh, however, uh, as to the remedies, when it comes to breach, uh, when it comes to breaches to the person's right, um, the civil law uh, provides us only with uh, liability for damages. And uh, even though liability for uh, liability for for immaterial laws, but other than that, there are no special uh, remedies uh, when it comes to a whistleblower and his protection. So, of course, there, uh, there, there is a personal data protection uh, application, but I would like to draw your attention to our new specialized act on protection of whistleblowers. 
Uh, as I was, as I already said, it is not yet fully established. And why is that? Um, compared to the previous act from the year of 2013, the biggest uh, step forward, I would say, is that this uh, this specialized act establishes a new uh, office uh, devoted just for a protection of whistleblowers. This office, however, was not yet established after a year and a half of effectiveness of this act. Apparently, there is no or uh, uh, very little political will to establish the specialized office uh, because the head of the office was uh, still not elected, although there were uh, truly qualified candidates uh, in, the, in, the, in the selection and selective process. Uh, so it uh, it doesn't really it doesn't really you know make sense uh, that we have this uh, specialized office if it's not uh, fully functioning. And why is that a problem? Uh, um, uh, when you compare this new act uh, with the previous act from 2014, there are not uh, many material changes. Only a few or slight. Maybe there's um, a, um, there was there was. Um, um, a way of perfecting the, the previous uh, the previous regulation, but the main step forward was to establish this office. This office has a really broad uh, broad competence uh, with regards to issue of whistleblowing and, and the protection of whistleblowers. First of all, the office itself may uh, suspend uh, the effectiveness of any negative uh, labor act from an employer to its employee uh, whistleblower uh, if uh, there's a direct causal link between the reporting and antisocial activity and uh, this negative labor act. So if the office considers that this act is really in a harmful way uh, done only uh, to as a revenge, yeah, or uh, in, a, in a causal link with the, the reported crime or reported, reported corruption, reported antisocial activity, this office uh, will have a really strong right to suspend the effectiveness until, you know, the all the report is verified and the, uh, uh, the issue of, um, and the issue is resolved. Other than that, if the employer already um, uh, if the employer wants to do uh, negative, uh, negatively with a negative impact, a labor act against its employee, um, and uh, the office doesn't approve of this act because uh, the office, um, uh, the office states that this act is, you know, uh, not not done. Uh, not done improperly, it is done only because of the, of the reported antisocial activity, then uh, this Labor Act is the URE, uh, pursuant to this act, invalid. So these two are really strong uh, of the office, uh, for protection of whistleblowers. Uh, other than that, the office um, has, is a controlling body, of course. So uh, the office may control all the employers if they indeed um, issued and adapted internal CSR standards if they are truly uh, if they are truly applied uh, in practice and if they are not uh, and if these internal CSR standards are not um, done pursuant to the act then the office itself may impose a fine. Other than that there are, uh, there are also financial incentives um, as well as uh, with this act and as well as with the previous act, the whistleblower is, a, uh, is uh, or may claim a file for a remuneration when uh, the conclusion of the verification process of the report of antisocial activities is that, that there was indeed a corruption or any antisocial activities, then this whistleblower is entitled to uh, an award or a, remuner a remuneration. And uh, the only authorized body uh, to grant or to award this kind of a remuneration is the office. So, uh, you know, when, uh, when it comes together, uh, the only uh, authorized body to, to grant a remuneration for a whistleblower is that one office, which is not yet established. So it's quite a shame on, on the on Slovak side you know, when it comes to this. And when you compare uh, this, uh, this new act with the previous act, um, I, as I already apart from establishing this office, there are only only uh, only 
like a cosmetic uh, cosmetic changes or for example anonymous reports uh, are not anymore considered uh, whistleblower reports i believe in my opinion the logic behind this is that when uh, and uh, somebody uh, an employee uh, files a report but uh, it's an anonymous there can be a protection for a whistleblower if nobody knows who filed a report then there cannot be a protection against you know, that uh, even though this new act is um, translated in our society that it's new and it's and it's more 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 perfect and we have this and we have this office there are still some loopholes and some gaps that should be perfected um, that should be perfected for example uh, the act really uh, provides a wide range of a wide range of protection to whistleblowers but only to whistleblowers as an employees when it comes to other persons, uh, for example, self-employed persons, um, members of statutory bodies or members of controlling bodies uh, working for company or contractors, so people working on civil law or com commercial contracts of course these are also the people that can uh, find out during their uh, working process about some antisocial activities uh, or, or corruption even but they are not um, protected to the same extent and in the same level as an employees why is that the office may as i already said suspend or uh, postpone the effectiveness of the But uh, people working on different contracts, civil or commercial contracts, are not protected from revengeful dismissal from their contractual relationship. Which is quite a shame because I don't see, I don't see any logic behind why why we protect uh, employees uh, in this kind on this type of situation more than uh, members of statutory bodies or, or people working based on contracts. So I believe that still after many revisions uh, and still uh, with. Uh, with this new act, uh, which uh, the previous, you know, the previous regulation was absolutely revised, there are still some loopholes to be to be uh, to be addressed. Um, other than that, I believe there are, uh, there are numerous uh, numerous um, opinions. Uh, if the uh, specialized office was or was not necessary to establish. Uh, I'm quite reserved uh, as uh, it comes to the premature uh, premature of my opinion. I believe that it all it all depends on the office itself, on the amount of work that will be done by the office. And I believe, and uh, if there there is. Uh, there is a qualified outcome, and if the people uh, will see that this this is uh, truly um, truly spectacle spectacle work in the issue of whistleblowing, I would say that this money on the office is money well spent. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Dr. Zurichakova for the interesting presentation and for the. Uh, explaining to us how the situation is in the Slovakia. And now we have come to the discussion. Uh, I can realize that there are not much, uh, not much questions uh, in the, in the uh, uh, questions uh, in, in the chat. There is a very long question now from the professor Hein, but maybe, uh, she has the, the remark for, about that, but maybe first we, we start with the discussion and later I will, I will read what was the remark from the professor. So uh, maybe my first uh, question to the, all the panelists will be uh, connected to the question that one of, the, uh, one of the, our participants had asked uh, at, at the previous panel and uh, Dr. Zurichako has already uh, said her opinion what do you think, and I am addressing all the speakers now, what do you think about the possibility or what do you think would be the best way uh, whether to uh, introduce a new authority in general authority to help whistleblowers or should it be left to the separate authorities for the separate uh, fields or sectors and so on? Or does it depend on the situation? How is the situation in your, in your country? So maybe if we go by the... Uh, or, or, the, or, or by the appearance. Uh, so maybe Professor Pichard, what do you think about the, this question? Um, regarding the first remark, uh, um, I think that uh, 
uh, it's uh, useful to establish the, the special way, uh, the special internal way, um, how to uh, how to uh, how to support the whistleblowers in Czech Republic because nowadays only uh, we have a small instrument for protection of whistleblower exists in in Czech law, as the colleague Moravec uh, mentioned. Uh, they are fragmented into various re legal regulation, and uh, so I think that it's not uh, so sufficient. But uh, uh, it's uh, de uh, depend up to situation of uh, labor justice in Czech Republic. Uh, in compare, for example, in Poland, uh, um, if I know about situation in Poland, is uh, per year about one hundred uh, complaint in labor law uh, dispute. Uh, and uh, in Poland exists uh, a wide range possibility, uh, alternative way how to dispute uh, labor, uh, labor uh, matter. Uh, in Czech uh, now, uh, we have not any way how to uh, out of court dispute labor, uh, labor, uh, labor matter. And uh, in compare with the Polish, we have only about 3,000 uh, labor matters which are resolved by a court per year. So if a Poland have about 40 million inhabitants and uh, uh, in Czech 10 million, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely uncomparable because uh, if it's the same situation as a Poland in Czech Republic, uh, we, we have to uh, resolve about, uh, um, about uh, 25,000 labor, labor, labor law disputes per year. So uh, it's uh, from, from it's uh, from from its compare. It's a good uh, good no, uh, known that uh, uh, may, maybe one question is that the Czech em employer uh, employee are so successful with the condition of labor law market that they don't want to 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 go before the court. But uh, the right question is that it's. Uh, very difficult legislative, a very, very difficult uh, uh, long trial before the court in Czech Republic. That's all the way how the Czech employee are uh, not uh, very often used to have any, any, any complaint against the employer. So uh, in this point of view, establish the special internal way how, how to, how to and, and uh, external way too, for, for example, special agency, a citizen scrape in the new a new proposal, uh, but the new proposal is uh, on the on the program in the afternoon uh, from the colleague from Minister of Justice. I, I think that it will be useful because, uh, in fact, uh, if I simplify, it's possible that Czech uh, employee are silent, silent about the conditions, silent about what 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 uh, what's uh, what, uh, what, uh, what the condition of uh, workplace, um, and uh, that's. A, uh, closely depend, in fact, in the difficult way how to reach justice due to court in Czech Republic if we have not special as a labor court and have, in fact, no way how to, how to reach uh, out of court settlement of labor law dispute. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Pichert. Uh, may, uh, Dr. Mar Moravec is not with us anymore and he will join us later, so he cannot uh, answer the, the question, but maybe do, um, Mr. Varvazovsky, what do you think about the special institution being introduced in Czech Republic? Uh, well, it will be problematic because uh, right now there is a discussion, a discussion about the We cannot hear you. Yes, sorry. Uh, there is a discussion about uh, what rules will the institution have. And so it should be a good idea, but the devil is in the details. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Kuhn, what do you think in Hungary? We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. 
Oh, can sorry. Hear you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think this is not the main issue whether to have or not a, a specific designated uh, institution. Uh, I think what is important to have uh, some kind of an institution what, what, which is clearly responsible for uh, such matters in Hungary. This is basically the Ombudsman uh, office. Of course, it's another issue that uh, we should discuss uh, what should be the role of such uh, institutions. And I think it's very important uh, that such institutions have to have the power, the real power to carry out substantive investigations. This is not really the case in Hungary because the Ombudsman office uh, can uh, not really have uh, substantive uh, effect and substantive procedures uh, in terms of whistleblowing. And it, it would be also very important uh, for such an institution to, to play a role of kind of a think tank, uh, dissemination of information, organizing trainings and stuff like that, information spreading. And uh, these competencies, these resources are also not really attached to the Ombudsman office currently in Hungary. So what I would say that the expertise, the practice practice is currently in Hungary with the Ombudsman office as the main protected uh, channel for external whistleblowing. But uh, maybe we should think about uh, in the future uh, whether to strengthen the functions uh, of the Ombudsman office or to create a separate uh, distinct uh, institution. And as I said in the beginning, I think it's not the main issue whether to have a separate institution. The main, uh, the most important thing is to have the proper competences and the proper resources, both financial and institutional institutional and legal competences. And maybe one uh, other small remark, because I saw a question about uh, the reporting of breaches of labor law. And uh, for a labor lawyer, it's a very interesting question. And to be very honest, when I first read the directive, I was first very surprised that in the annex, where there is the list of uh, the uh, reportable breaches of European law, uh, why uh, employment and uh, labor matters are not mentioned. Of course, there is a reason for that. Uh, we cannot go into details with this now, but to be honest, I would say that uh, whistleblowing could be a very important uh, additional private channel for labor law in enforcement. So I totally agree with this uh, gentleman. I cannot read uh, his name in the ch chat it's panel. Professor Hein, Professor uh, Hein from I'm sorry. University uh, of Łódź. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree that uh, mm -hmm. there are some um, perspectives in whistleblowing in terms of labor law. In enforcement and also in Hungary uh, ADR alternative dispute resolution is very weak uh, also the court based enforcement of labor law is very weak we don't really have labor courts anymore uh, from this year and the number of labor law cases are going down so there are not much possibilities for employees to report breaches of uh, either European or national labor law so I really regret uh, also uh, in terms of the directive that this is not very much uh, uh, um, emphasized and supported. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's it. So you think that national regulation should include also yeah, labor yeah, law matters? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I am biased, of course, as a labor lawyer, but uh, no, I would no. say yes, 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 yes. Yes, but your because... answer, but your answer reflects the the differences between our systems. And maybe my answer, my opinion that it's not so necessary was for Slovenia because yeah. in Slovenia labor law protection is really comprehensive yeah. and efficient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. that we can see the differences here. Of yes. course, that's why we have directives so we <laughs> yes. can adapt the directives to the specific national situation. But in Hungary, of course, I am very general and brief now. But labor law enforcement uh, suffers from many many problems, and um, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this could be an additional private channel to yes. report breaches. I agree. I agree. Uh, may maybe Professor Skupien would like to to give her opinion. Dagmara, please. Yes, thank you. As it concerns the question uh, concerning the whistleblowers uh, center, um, yes, yes, I think um, I would perceive the the role of such a whistleblower center uh, on a national scale as firstly centrally led uh, information center disseminating information uh, also uh, maybe with the role of properly streaming different complaints uh, different disclosures because as i indicated in my presentation sometimes uh, it's really very unclear where to address where this correct prescribed body um, is 
As to the um, comments of Professor Zbigniew Hein, uh, I think that the lack of uh, labor issues in the catalog of EU whistleblowing directive uh, breaches is really flagrant, is visible. And uh, I think that if a national legislator is allowed to enlarge this catalog, I think that it would be really useful and recommended to to introduce um, labor law breaches into this catalog. The, the third question, the most difficult, <laughs> if, um, if whistleblowing uh, should be introduced as an additional criterion, because I agree that now it's very doubtful if um, the discrimination, um, the, the, the non-discrimination uh, rules apply, uh, it seems that the whistleblower is protected under general equality um, provisions. But I think uh, we, should, we should reflect if whistleblowing does not deserve to be uh, an explicit additional criterion in this um, in this catalog. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Prof Professor Skupian has already addressed the question from Professor Hein. Yes. I don't know whether the uh, participants can see the question. That's why maybe I will just uh, tell what the question is. It's uh, the question regarding the whistleblowing be being uh, additional personal circumstances in the context of uh, discrimination. So whether this is possible that or this is or should it be should it be treated as a as a as a personal circumstance or should this protection uh, regarding the discrimination should be uh, given also to to on the on the ground of, of whistleblowing. So maybe any additional comment on this from the panelists. Maybe we should start with with the doctor uh, Zorichakova. Thank you. I'm so sorry that Peter is not here because he's a specialist for, for okay. anti-discrimination matters. But I believe that uh, today uh, the Slovak Anti-Discrimination Act is formulate, formulated really broadly. So um, there is uh, quite a chance that a whistleblower protection is you know, contained already in the, uh, our Anti-Discrimination Act. But you know, as, to, um, as to the fact that we have this special act, it is not uh, an issue. Yeah, in our legal framework, I would say. Thank you. What do you think, what do you, Professor Kuhn, what do you think about this question? Uh, I believe that if we have specific uh, rules and regulations for whistleblowing, we don't really need this uh, additional uh, channel. Of course, uh, the, the model of uh, anti-discrimination law could be very useful uh, for whistleblowing in terms of reversal of burden of proof and uh, issues like that, but I don't see the necessity uh, to have whistleblowing as a specific uh, protected characteristic. Although the Hungarian uh, law uh, contains an open list in terms of protected characteristics. So mm -hmm. with a creative legal interpretation, we could say that whistleblowing could be a protected characteristic. But uh, again, if we have a specific regulation, either in labor law or in a separate law, we don't really need this channel. Only the ideas, the model of this yes. channel. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That, that would be very important that this model to, to use this yeah. model because we know that this is a very developed model anti discrimination yeah. law all this uh, uh, or, yeah. or, or these rules which are connected to this could be used also yeah, yeah, for yeah. This and maybe law. not only the rules as you are saying Daria but also the kind of mainstreaming of uh, yeah, yeah. Um, this um, values and these ideas mm -hmm. okay yeah. thank you maybe professor Pickert any other additional comment on this on those topics I think I agree with uh, Professor, agree. Professor Attila Kuhn. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, only, only one notice. Uh, it, 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 uh, uh, the first proposal from Czech government, it uh, goes such a way to incorporate it, uh, the whistleblower protection into the Anti-Discrimination Act. And uh, it was uh, not successful because our Anti-Discrimination Act, it wasn't designed for such a situation. Uh, it's only one notice, um, no one, is born like a whistleblower, unlike this advantageous person, for example. Uh, I hope that uh, whistleblower becomes hopeful after mature consideration, and this is the reason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, maybe Mr. Varazovsky, any additional comments on the topics we have been uh, here discussing? Here I have no specialization. Yeah, I, I am not for this question a good people, a good person to answer it. Sorry. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we still have some time. Uh, Professor Skupien, uh, maybe shall we continue with the discussion or shall we stop? The... <laughs> It, I'm asking it, our, it depends, our... <laughs> it depends on the will of, of speakers and participants. On the yeah. other hand, uh, we may maybe have a little rest. Unfortunately, we are not in Prague at the Charles yes. University, which is famous for the hospitality. <laughs> we cannot offer a lunch, but maybe we deserve some, some rest before the, the first session chaired by Professor Attila Kuhn. What do you think? Yes, I think so. uh, if, if, uh, if, if so, uh, please kindly uh, join us again, uh, clicking at the, at the link uh, uh, at uh, 1.30, yes? So 30. only nine minutes break? Professor no, Central Pacek, you, you decide. <laughs> no, no, you are the boss. I mean, the, 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 uh, this is only nine minutes, so probably we will we will finish our break in, oh, I don't know, half an hour or 15 minutes? I, I think that uh, we, we should uh, stick to the time because there are some speakers, participants coming just for the third mm -hmm. session. So mm -hmm. maybe if you could prolong to a quarter to, to a quarter two, to two. a okay. quarter to two, yes. A quarter to two then, yes? Yes, okay. please, please kindly come a little bit in advance so that we log again. So we are closing now this panel and I wish you all a nice break without, uh, uh, without the lunch altogether, but <laughs> yes. yeah, your own lunch. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. Thank you.
has on views from public authorities and civil society as it concerns um, whistleblower protection. I would like uh, to kindly ask uh, Professor Attila Kuhn to start then the third session. Hello, uh, welcome back to everyone. I hope you can hear me properly. Okay, so uh, I think we shouldn't misuse our time and uh, we can start uh, this uh, afternoon and uh, last session of our conference. Usually after lunch, if we have real life conferences, we uh, have uh, this time a nice coffee together somewhere in the garden and <laughs> talk a little bit more informally, but now we don't have this possibility. So we are back to our monitors uh, again. And it's also quite normal that we lose some participants hopefully they will join us uh, sooner or later uh, but it happens in real life conferences as well that uh, the afternoon session is a little bit less visited than the morning session but as I see people are coming back so I'm optimistic in that sense as Dagmara also introduced uh, I am also uh, very uh, optimistic about this panel because in the morning session we had very general holistic academic national reports from the core staff of this project and now we have a very interesting uh, panel of guest speakers from different countries and uh, the setting of these guest speakers is also very interesting in terms of professional background because if I take a look at the uh, list of uh, the speakers we will have six uh, speakers in the afternoon uh, we have uh, representatives of the government the police uh, human rights agencies trade unions NGOs we also have private attorneys private uh, lawyers so it's really a color for mix of professional background and even nationalities. So I really don't want to misuse my time and I would uh, really like to give the virtual floor to our first speaker, who is Johanna Treslova. Uh, she is a senior ministerial counselor at the Conflict of Interest and Anti-Corruption Department of the Ministry of Justice of the Czech Republic. Uh, please, Johanna, the floor is uh, yours. I see that you have already shared the slides, so please start. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I would like uh, first and foremost uh, yeah. the organizers for making this event possible, even under those circumstances, and for bringing all those wonderful speakers together. It has been really helpful hearing uh, about different experiences uh, and views regarding the protection of whistleblowers, which is undoubtedly a very important topic. So today I will be speaking about draft law on the protection of whistleblowers in the Czech Republic. Uh, I will first explain the state of play and uh, then I will be talking about some challenges we encountered uh, during the process of transposition the directive into Czech law. So as for the state of play, you've already uh, might have guessed that the Ministry of Justice is the authority responsible for the transposition of the directive. Uh, we are currently finishing the inter interdepartmental comment procedure, during which we discuss the final form of the draft law with ministries, other state authorities and representatives from the academic sphere and from the NGOs. So uh, the, the interdepartmental comment procedure is coming, coming to an end and the submission to the government is expected in, uh, next week or in the upcoming weeks. Uh, you've already heard that there is no complex legislation concerning the protection of whistleblowers in the Czech Republic at the moment, and that there were five different legislative proposals regarding the protection of whistleblowers since uh, 2012. Uh, we, uh, we were really operating on a quite uh, tight schedule here since we needed to wait for the final version of the, di of the directive on one hand, and on the other hand, the term of Office of the Chamber of Deputies is slowly coming to an end. 
And uh, since we usually have a very lengthy legislative process, we tried our best to submit, uh, submit it to the government as soon as possible. And at the same time, create a law which would not only be transposing the directive, but also would provide whistleblowers with effective and sufficient protection. So uh, the fact that this is a transposition draft law definitely helps facilitate the process. Uh, although transposing uh, this directive with regard to the national law proved to be quite tricky, especially while trying to find some common ground with other stakeholders participating on the process. Mm, I am assuming that you are all familiar with the directive, at least to some extent, but just to sum it up, the directive provides with minimum standards yeah. of protection and of persons reporting breaches of certain union acts in a work-related context. So I will not be talking about the similarities comparing the directive and the draft law on protection of whistleblowers, after all, it is a transposing legislation, but rather I will focus on some differences between the directive and the draft law and some challenges that we have come across. So overall, we struggled, especially with balancing the protection of whistleblowers and maintaining some standard work processes and steps that are common for employers to take. Uh, we have met with resistance from the private sector, uh, which in many cases pushed back, uh, especially against the obligation to implement the internal reporting system. And we have also struggled with the concept of sharing the uh, reporting systems among different in entities, uh, which is somehow illogically limited in some ways by the directive. Another critical aspect of the directive is the protection of the public disclosure, uh, which was also discussed before, and it is fairly broad in the directive. So when transposing those as aspects uh, of the directive into the uh, national law, we were overall forced to follow strictly the provisions concerned and the, word, uh, the wording of the directive. And uh, more specifically to the different aspects of draft law. Uh, first, I would like to focus on one very important aspect of the draft law in which we have deviated from the directive for the benefit of the whistleblowers, and that is the material scope. Uh, because as you may know, according to the directive, the whistleblower can report breaches falling within the scope of certain union acts while maintaining the work-related uh, context. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, there is no complex system of protection of whistleblowers in the Czech Republic. So we decided to broaden the material scope and under the Czech draft law, it is possible uh, for the whistleblower to report breaches that are all crimes and offenses. So you can re report all crimes and offenses and above that other breaches that fall within the scope of certain union acts while maintaining the work-related context. Uh, as far as it goes for the external, external reporting channel, uh, as you heard before and as was discussed, uh, the initial idea was to create a brand new authority which would be competent in the area of protection whistleblowers but uh, that was mainly unfortunately viewed as too financially demanding an option, uh, which led to the absent of, absence of political will for such an approach. So after very critical evaluation of all other options and thorough discussion with other authorities that would be eligible uh, for taking up this agenda and responsibility, we designed the external reporting channel to be a new specialized department of the Ministry of Justice, since we are responsible for the fight against corruption. And thus we have already the human and material resources to be responsible for this agenda. And besides that, uh, the other authorities that would be eligible, eligible for taking up this agenda uh, didn't agree to say at least with uh, taking up this new responsibility. So as far as it goes for the protection measures, uh, we 
in, in the draft law, we imposed a general prohibition of retaliation. And uh, we also simplified the process uh, of granting provisional measures. For example, we uh, lifted the obligation to leisure security when asking for a provisional measure. Uh, the Ministry of Justice will also provide assistance and uh, during and before the process for whistleblowers and other concerned persons. And of course, uh, we also Im impose the reversed uh, burden of proof. As uh, for the effective proportionate and dissuasive penalties, as are presumed, uh, presumed by the directive, uh, we felt that the most appropriate were administrative sanctions, and we imposed fines up to 1 million crowns, uh, which is approximately 37,000 euros for retaliation. Uh, the fines that are applicable to whistleblowers for making knowingly false report uh, are up to 50,000 crowns, which is 1800 euros approximately. So that was a short introduction of uh, our draft law on protection of whistleblowers. And I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johanna, for this very clear and very timely uh, presentation, which took us a little bit behind the skins of uh, Czech lawmaking. Um, yeah, uh, maybe we will come back uh, in, during the discussion part. Um, we can have specific questions uh, to this uh, proposal maybe, but uh, I propose that now we should continue and let's uh, go to the second speaker of this panel, who is Mr. Peter, uh, Peter Kovarik, uh, who is the acting president of the police um, of the Slovak Republic. And he has tremendous uh, professional experience uh, in the field of anti-corruption. and He was working in many governmental institutions before dealing with the issue. Uh, so we are very much looking forward uh, his presentation. So, uh, Mr. Kovarik, the floor is yours if you are here. And yes. Please share. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please share the slides. I'm trying to share. Hello, everybody. And mm. I lost, lost the presentation after sharing. Give me just a second. Do you see my presentation? No. Not yet. Okay. In the meantime, let me say one sentence to the audience. Uh, we forgot to say in the beginning of the session that, of course, the technical rules uh, for this afternoon session are very much the same like in the morning session. So please feel free to give your comments uh, and uh, also to ask questions either to all the speakers or to specific uh, or to a specific speaker. Uh, and please write these questions, preferably in English, in the chat box or in the question box, and we will collect them uh, at the end of the session. Okay, now I see. I try to share again. You have to push F5 uh, full screen. Ah, okay, uh, okay, F5. I do it. Uh, I suppose, uh, or making the presentation full screen. And if it's full screen, it will be recognized by the Zoom, as far as I know. You need to click on the presentation and uh, make it full screen. Uh, and please, uh, also your uh, microphone is switched out now. Could you please turn on the mic? Yeah, yeah, now, now, yeah, now, now, now. Yeah, yeah, the mi mic is perfect. Mi mic is working, but uh, my... Okay, now uh, I Mr. Would... Kovacic, because we have your presentation, would you like our supporter that uh, he shares uh, your presentation? Yeah. Yes? What would hap happen? I lost your... your... 
Uh -huh. Now I can see you. Okay. I try to share again. And F5, you said. Uh, yes, or full screen anyway. Uh... Okay. If you if you can put presentation by you, it it will be working maybe. I when I do it, I lost uh, the the picture of the Zoom. Okay, I, I will give some help to our technical moderator. Mm -hmm. Sorry for this. No problem. I'm sorry. I am only <laughs> responsible for the <laughs> professional uh, yeah, but, things, uh, but, and we have a colleague from Poland who will. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah. that's yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. But one remark, uh, please yeah. kindly say change the slide. Okay. Because it will be our moderator who is helping okay. with it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for helpful. Uh, helpful Not at all, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, just let me say that, uh, uh, firstly, let me apologize. Yeah, I, I couldn't be uh, with you uh, during the, the, the um, presentation which, which, is, which we're uh, pro producing. My, I'm absolutely uh, uh, busy, so uh, please check, uh, change the slide. Okay, uh, let me say somewhat about the history of, of this law. Uh, when I was head of anti-corruption bureau in 2012, uh, I and my colleague we were preparing this law uh, because there were some needs in uh, in public and in my office uh, there were some needs because if we were working with uh, witness and if we got some information which was uh, which was uh, a little bit uh, complicated for for the witness and it, which can cause uh, some harm uh, harm to to him uh, we decided to create the law and we got support from the ministry of interior so uh, at the time we created some rules how the law would working and we tried to set up the, the rule uh, for practice way. Uh, we had, uh, uh, we had uh, in 2013 uh, premature election, so the, the working was stopped and uh, then was finalized in 2014 and the law uh, started working in practice in 2015. Uh, when I came back uh, to, uh, to public uh, um, service in 2017, uh, we evaluated if the law is working or if uh, it doesn't. And we were communicated with the inspection, labor inspection service, uh, which was responsible for protecting of, of, the, of the witnesses, or not only for witnesses, but for, for the people who give them give us any, uh, any information. And uh, we checked that we have only, or we had uh, for three years, we had only 60 cases uh, where the protection was given to person and only a few of them were in practice, uh, mm, I have to say, in, uh, in important. So, uh, in 2017, we had meeting with the OECD colleagues and they evaluated uh, what problem we have with the law and, and, we, and we knew at the time what is the main problem. The main problem was that, that people uh, didn't believe really we can help them. And uh, it was, that was the reason why the using of, of the law was so, so small. So, when I was speaking, when I was speaking with the prime minister, he asked me if we can do some do some amendment uh, of this law to to be more more effective in in using of this law. So we take we took at the time the recommendation from OECD and we and we took recommendation from the for, from the public, and uh, we created a commission which were preparing new law and the person who were. Uh, in this uh, commission, where uh, uh, some some lawyer from the offices uh, which were connected to the protection, uh, general prosecutor office, ministry of justice, ministry of interior, and uh, office of the government, and we asked to support us uh, from the from the NGO sector. So three NGO organization came to the to the commission, and then we were setting some rules 
which would be more effective. So after, after this, uh, we, we created a new law and I will say, say you some words about this law. So please change the slide. Okay. Uh, the new whistleblower protection law entered it into force uh, on March 1st, 2019. Uh, we tried to uh, change the rules uh, such way that, that uh, the law would be more effective in practice. So the, the main request from the NGO sector was uh, be, be more uh, visible, be more effective, and uh, be, be cooperative with the witnesses. And because we had a uh, labor uh, inspection office, uh, which, which had some other duties, the NGOs, uh, NGOs organization gave us uh, some, some advice to create independent office for the whistleblower protection. Uh, the, main, the main problem for creating of this uh, office was uh, find money for, for such office. We, we count that, um, that we need about 1 million euro for set up of this euro and uh, for, for this office and uh, then about 60, uh, uh, 600, 600,000 euro for each year uh, of uh, providing of, of, of services. We uh, were thinking about 20 people inside of, of this office. Uh, half of them would be like, like lawyers and specialized person who, who uh, make some duties from the law. And the second part was supportive because we need some, some uh, I don't know, uh, uh, department which, which covers all, all uh, things regarding, uh, regarding the office. Uh, we can we can change the slide. I I will speak firstly about about the system of the protection. We have we have uh, two uh, possibilities how to protect. First possibility is to protect uh, inside or into uh, or by maybe say uh, internal channel. We we try to. Uh, we try to, to get result that people want to cooperate with us, with, with, with the public uh, officials and organizations. And we uh, you would like to have information uh, from them goes to or go to, to uh, our offices and try to avoid of some criminal proceeding because it is in our interest to, to to get information if something is uh, going not good way. Into, uh, by internet channel, there, there is protecting uh, some, some uh, um, administrative, uh, uh, administrative uh, how to say, um, I lost the word, the problems, not, not specific crimes, but but administrative, uh, administrative, uh, sorry, administrative uh, information. If something in, in the or, in organization is going uh, is going uh, is not going to good way, uh, after taking of this information uh, by by the person who is responsible for protecting a whistleblower in the organization, uh, we have duty in organization. Uh, check what what happened or, or what what's the problem is, and uh, for for this checking we have sixty days, and we can prolong for another thirty days if it is complicated information. So the first intention is to get information and check the information. Then we have ten days to to give information back to informant who who gave us uh, the whistleblower which which gave us information. And this, it is very important to give him information what happened, uh, just to have some uh, some support from him and uh, and have, uh, uh, have have good relation with this with this person. And uh, after this uh, after this proceeding, if something happen or, or, or happen or during this proceeding, if something happened to the whistleblowers, the this uh, person who is responsible 
has to give him his uh, give him the protection which is necessary or or all protection which we can give him it means that when i was uh, the this person responsible person if i got the information and if something happened uh, regarding the whistleblower i did everything what was necessary to protect him i came to the to the chief of the government office and if something happened which didn't but if something happened i i had to request uh, security or, or some uh, some uh, uh, um, some measures to protect the whistleblower. Uh, the whistleblower can give us any 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 information. This is th there is no uh, specific specific provision which can uh, which has to be uh, which has to be done regarding the information. We has we have to check any information. I'll explain later, or, or we can change the slide. I explain how it is working with, with external channel, and then I try to go back. So we can change the slide. Okay, thank you. If, if the uh, information has some feature that, that it is information about committing of crime, and we have, uh, we have in the law, we have specific request what crime would be committed, but there is general provision if, if uh, uh, because of crime can be, if the crime can be sentenced, uh, the, the, uh, the punishment bigger than three years, that this is crime which, which uh, give, us, uh, give us possibility to protect the, the whistleblower. And then there are some other crime which are connected to corruption where, where the same possibility exists. So if the whistleblower have information, it's very easy uh, to, to get protection. Uh, we have system that the person who is, respect, uh, who is res responsible for, for uh, prosecuting of this crime, so not policeman, but prosecutor, which, which uh, is about the, the investigator, will check what information is about, if it is enough, evidence inside of this, of uh, uh, evidence uh, about some crime in the information. If it is useful for the prosecuting or, or the investigation, uh, prosecutor has to give, give the protection or give information that the person is protected. And uh, such easy way, the prosecutors uh, have, um, has to uh, send uh, information to the employee employer and employee. And uh, in the moment of delivery of information that the whistleblower is, uh, is uh, that the person is a whistleblower, no, no, uh, uh, no, how to say, um, any, any attempt to to go against the, the, the whistleblower in the system, which, which can mean that the, uh, any, any uh, sorry, I, I uh, lost the word, but uh, any attempt to, to give some... Uh, Maybe to, if you could say, it, if you could switch into in Slovak. Slo no, into okay. Slovak, yes, if you could uh, switch the channel, uh, please. Please use the interpretations yeah. mode. Okay, okay, okay. I try to. Sorry. Change into po, Slovak, po, please. Po, yes. Počujete ma teraz po slovensky? Yes, yes. <laughs> a, a je to prekladané? Okay, tak ja skúsim rozprávať, keď tak ma zastavte, ak, ak nebude. Čiže... So I'll try to speak uh, Slovak, so... At the very moment when the prosecutor's office uh, applies the protection, uh, since that moment, the uh, employer cannot uh, apply any measures against uh, or harming uh, the uh, uh, employee. It means that everything has to be approved by the employee. If, for example, 
there is no consent from the employee's side, then the employer needs the consent from our office, which means no measures will be applied towards an employee without his or her consent. In the absence of his or her consent, the dedicated office, office has to analyze what happened in this organization, uh, in this institution, whether this negative deed uh, it was uh, grounded or not. For example, if we talk about a driver who had a negative uh, alcohol test, he wouldn't have uh, the right to be protected. But if it wasn't related to this kind of specific wrongdoing, if uh, uh, the employer is just taking revenge on, on him, we wouldn't agree. We wouldn't give as an office our consent uh, for that. The same goes for administrative uh, infringements. Uh, there can be a sanction uh, which uh, uh, goes up to 3,000 euros. If in a given uh, unit entity, an internal channel was used, then, in practice, this means that the office gives its protection to the person concerned. The office gives protection, but the employee has to ask for protection in a court, before a court. If, uh, there is an offense uh, which is not subject to protection uh, and limited protection can be applied and it expires in the case which is uh, quoted on the slide you can see on your screens. If uh, this whistleblower uh, is uh, fired, for example, or where it has been proved that uh, he uh, he gave false information about someone and some other cases where this kind of protection can uh, expire. But uh, usually this protection lasts for three years after uh, the procedure is finished. Uh, just a couple of words about the office itself. The office, well, is supposed to strengthen our credibility thanks to this office, we can uh, ensure a transparent uh, procedure of electing uh, the president of this office for protection, for whistleblowers protection. We have like five candidates. Uh, there is a call for uh, candidatures and uh, they have to prove their qualifications, their skills. So we pre they present their candidacy to the prime minister and to the ombudsman. We also have among in the commission uh, uh, someone who is from an NGO from some other institutions which are independent. Uh, so in this case, it's not possible to manage manipulate this call for uh, proposals. So the president of this office is really independent. So he can also uh, carry out um, a complementary control. Uh, if, uh, for example, uh, um, some application is filed and it's, it raises doubts, uh, the president can um, uh, tell uh, the organization which is concerned by a whistleblower's information what is wrong. So uh, to finish my presentation, I would like to say something uh, really uh, important, something that didn't work well. It's that we still haven't chosen or elected the president because I'm afraid that uh, two independent elections means a complicated procedure from the political point of view and the support from the parliament. We have a second round now of electing because it's uh, up to the parliament to choose between two candidates. So now it's the second round and we are now waiting whether the candidates will be accepted or not, approved or not by the parliament. Uh, I may, ha may have exceeded my time. I'm a, uh, sorry for my English. I hope I will be able to answer your questions. Thank you very much. No, no thank, you thank you very much. Very much. Perfect timing. Uh, no problem. And uh, thank you very much for this 
insider's perspective into uh, the Slov Slovak situation. And also thank you for swiftly and quickly uh, solving these technical digital problems. Uh, yeah. It was uh, perfect in that sense at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, uh, let's go to the next uh, round of speakers. Uh, so far, I, I am very sorry because for Hungarian, it's very difficult to pronounce uh, Czech, Slovak or Polish names, but now I have an easy task because uh, uh, Hungarian colleagues are coming. Uh, Mr. Atira Guyash and Mrs. Zuzanna Baksha, they are both uh, colleagues and officers of the Ombudsman uh, office. Uh, as far as I know, Zuzanna will take the lead. She will be speaking. She is the deputy head of the client service and the Department of the Protection of Whistleblowers of the Office of the Commissioner of Fundamental Rights of Hungary, uh, so to say the Ombudsman's Office, which is the main protected uh, channel for external whistleblowing. So I'm sure that they or she can share uh, important insights uh, of the text into the task of this office. The floor is yours, Susanna. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the organizers bringing alive this online event, despite of the current situation, and of course, uh, inviting the represent representatives of the Office of the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights of Hungary. Well, um, please allow me to present uh, the role of the Office of the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights of Hungary within the whistleblower protection system in Hungary in accordance with the EU directive. Well, uh, there are many topics which I won't uh, talk about uh, um, uh, regarding that it, it has been already mentioned already by Professor Kuhn. So, um, Let's start uh, with the current national legislation, which is two main acts. Uh, one is on the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights, and the other is the so-called uh, Act on Complaints and Public Interest Disclosures, referred as CPID later on. Uh, considering the fact that the Commissioner is dealing with both complaints and uh, public interest disclosures, it's very uh, important to make a difference between them. So according to Act on CPID, a complaint is a request for putting an end to a violation of an individual rights or interest. And a public interest disclosure draws attention to a circumstance, the dying or discontinuation of which is in the interest of the community or the whole society. So in case we receive um, a report which is a complaint, another department of the CPR's office inquires the case. Um, Referring to the uh, EU directive, uh, we have a protected electronic system for public interest disclosures, disclosures which is uh, operated by the CFR's office. And with the, within the office, the Department for Protection of Public Interest and Client Service operates this electronic system. So we can, we can say that this is the external reporting channel. Um, if a whistleblower uh, wants to submit uh, a case, they can use the electronic system, which is on the interface uh, established for this purpose on the homepage of the office or in person at the customer service. If they use the electronic system, they can submit their report without identification or with identification. The identification in this case goes through the client gate, which is operated by the government. In case uh, they submit their case in person at the customer service, the official in charge will identify the whistleblower. Uh, this is how our interface looks from the user uh, point of view. So you can see that there is a, a, a box for submit a case without identification. And in, in case B, you can submit the case with identification through the client gate. Later on, uh, they can decide whether they submit a complaint or a public interest disclosure. And uh, submitting a case with identification through the client date, it looks like as follows. Uh, there is a signing in process through the client date. And after signing in, there is a data checking. And after uh, the whistleblower comes to the uh, side where he can submit uh, its case, there is a part for, for um, personal data. Postal address, email, and phone number uh, is requested. 
There is a box for description of the public interest disclosure. They can also attach files, photographs. Uh, and there is, of course, a very important part of this form, a request for anonymity. So when they uh, filled up this form, uh, the process starts in our office. Um, according to the uh, EU directive, the identification data stored only in, in the electronic system, it shall include the name and address of the whistleblower. This is very important later, uh, according to the, the whistleblower's liability and protection. Uh, in practice, this means that the whistleblower has to reveal his or her name uh, and address just for the commissioner. After receiving the public interest disclosure without identification, we send a recorded delivery letter in which we ask the whistleblower to identify herself or himself in order to be able to make accessible uh, the public interest disclosure to the acting uh, or authorized body. Uh, the delivery is actually completed by visiting uh, the electronic system and entering with their password and generated code what we sent in the letter. Um, the whistleblower uh, were making a public interest disclosure to the uh, Commissioner for Fundamental Rights through the electronic system. Uh, they may request that their personal data are only made available to the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights and the office, of course. In this case, uh, we shall oblige um, the public interest disclosure in order to ensure that it does not contain any data that may enable the identification of the whistleblower. In practice, we call this anonymized extract. Um, the body uh, entitled or the competent authority uh, to proceed shall manage the public interest disclosure which came through this electronic system in the same manner as it received directly, except that the body entitled uh, shall record in the electronic system uh, information about uh, its action or inex inaction, so everything. Um, in case of uh, a request for anonymity, uh, the whistleblower shall not be heard or informed orally. Uh, the investigation shall not be omitted on the grounds that the whistleblower cannot be, be uh, identified. And the whistleblower, uh, to contact with the, uh, the whistleblower shall only be kept through this electronic system. And of course, uh, the body authorized to proceed may contact the whistleblower through the Office of the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights. Uh, in lack of a request for anonymity, the personal data of the whistleblower is disclosed to no other recipient than the competent authority to carry out the necessary proceedings. The body in question uh, is entitled, entitled to process such data person to the law, and without this explicit consent, the personal data of the whistleblower are not made public, just with the following exception. Uh, in case where it becomes clear that the whistleblower has disclosed untrue information or of crucial importance in bad faith and there is an indication that a crime or an offense has been committed or caused unlawful damage or other harm, then uh, his or her data are disclosed upon the request of the body or person entitled to initiate or, or, or carry out proceedings. Well, uh, the whole process uh, of the uh, whistleblower's reports uh, are as follows. The public interest disclosure shall be referred to the body entitled or, or the, to the competent authority to proceed within eight days uh, from receipt. Um, the referral shall be notified sim simultaneously to the whistleblower and uh, the body authorized shall, uh, the public interest disclosure shall be assessed to the, uh, I mean, shall be assessed within 30 days after receipt by the body uh, authorized. And of course, during uh, these days, if the in investigation uh, is expected to last longer than 30 days, they have to uh, inform the whistleblower thereof. And at the end, uh, they have to uh, inform the whistleblower immediately um, after their actions, uh, inactions, when the, uh, the investi investigation is completed. The uh, electronic system uh, shall assign a unique identification number, which is a generated code to each public interest disclosure. Uh, the commissioner um, shall make available to all, uh, to everyone, to the public on the internet, a brief summary of the substance, ex excluding, of course, personal data and specific institutional data. 
uh, and the status of each public interest disclosure. In, in uh, practice, we call this as a public extract. So everyone can see this on, on the interface of the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights. Um, this electronic system is designed uh, as to enable contact with the whistleblower on the basis of the unique identification number and the password uh, they enter at the beginning. Uh, I'm uh, not going to talk about the uh, protection of these blowers and of course uh, uh, other things uh, which were already uh, were mentioned by Mr. Uh, Professor Kuhn, but um, it's, it's also uh, important to note that uh, regarding the support measures, the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights already has uh, made a recommendation to the Ministry of Justice uh, in a report in 2017 uh, when uh, he stated that the relevant legal regulations are not clear and adequately detailed concerning the support measures, neither in the Act on Complaints and Public Interest Disclosures, nor in the Act on Legal Aid. And furthermore, it is not clearly defined which authority shall establish that the whistleblower is at risk. Um, also, the certification related to the fact that a person can benefit from protection is not regulated under our national law yet. And this is also very important that psychological support to these blowers should be uh, provided by the government. Lack of such measures that may result that in Hungary people are reluctant to become a whistleblower from free fear of being stigmatized. So, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, um, referring back to, to the statement of uh, Professor Kuhn regarding the power and capacity of the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights concerning, concerning the investigation of these polar cases, it is very important to talk about the competence of, uh, of the Commissioner's office. Uh, so... The Commissioner for Fundamental Rights shall inquire into the practice of authorities uh, handling public interest disclosures uh, and upon request as well uh, when a whistleblower uh, requests to um, the, the investigation of the commissioner it is possible if uh, he or she uh, thinks that the public interest disclosure is qualified as unfounded or uh, he or she uh, does not agree with the conclusion of the investigation or according to the whistleblower, the competent authority has failed to conduct a comprehensive inquiry. Uh, and the result is, uh, in some cases, a report that is not legally binding. And the acting body, however, must report back to us uh, whether he may accept it or reject the recommendations, what the commissioner uh, said. Um, so these are the, the sanctions of the commissioner. They are according to the general rules uh, of act on the commissioner for fundamental rights. Um, I'm not going to talk about this now. Uh, what is mainly important that we have yearly three or 400 reports. The material scope of, of these reports are mainly uh, operation of public transport companies, environmental protection cases, matters falling within the competence of the police uh, or local government cases and in some cases tax evasion practices of some companies or private individuals. The most frequently addressed acting bodies are ministries, the National Authority for Data Protection and Freedom of Information, government offices, local governments and police stations. So as a summary, um, I would say that the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights Office is the external channel according to the EU directive. The protection of the whistleblowers through the electronic system is mainly fulfilled. Uh, and also recommendations are made to the Ministry of Justice, who is responsible for, for the implementation of the EU directive and meeting with the ministries in the near future. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Zuzanna, uh, for this very clear, very detailed 
presentation again with the insider's look into the uh, procedures of the Ombudsman's uh, office. Now we are moving uh, from the sphere of public offices, public institutions to the other side of the coin. And now we will have three peak speakers from the trade union movement, from NGOs and the uh, practicing lawyer. Uh, the first speaker from this uh, cluster of speakers is Martin Jefflin. I am very happy to introduce him. He is a very important figure of European social dialogue. He is coming from uh, the Swedish TCO originally, and he is the president of the Euro Cadres trade union uh, organization on the European level. And he's also a founder and leader uh, of the whistleblowerprotection.eu, which is one of the leading think tank and platform uh, in the field. So I'm very much looking for his perspectives. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I hope you can see my presentation currently. So my name is indeed Martin Jeflien. I am the president of Eurocadres. Uh, I will be speaking on a couple of necessary fixes for a successful transposition of the whistleblowing directive. Uh, first, a few words about why Eurocadres is involved. We are a trade union of uh, professionals and managers. So we are representing 6 million professionals and managers. Our members are often the first ones to come across sensitive information. For us, this is about responsibility and professional ethics. We came into this issue through the issue of trade secrets, which has been mm -hmm. uh, addressed a couple of times today. Um, Excuse me, we don't see your presentation. You don't see my presentation. Okay. I try it again. Share. Yeah, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Yeah. Okay. That was the first one. Here's the second one. Um, and um, professionals and managers are highly mobile and easily move across borders. Uh, as was mentioned, I did was part of founding whistleblowerprotection.eu through Eurocadres, uh, which have been working for some years. Uh, we had three years to, to work before we actually got a directive in force, so we were efficient, it's, even if it's not, of course, only our doing. A couple of things that are strengths with the directive that are also important to safeguard. First of all, it gives rights. It is not only a directive, it also comes with a communication from the Commission, which asks the member states to go beyond, and this I will come into when I come to the recommendations. It includes a wide personal scope, it actually includes an open list in the personal scope, so that is indeed an opportunity. Uh, it voids non-disclosure agreements in parts which restrict whistleblowing, copyright, trade secrets, etc. And we managed to get rid of the requirement to lawfully uh, acquire documents uh, in order to be able to share them in, in a report. And finally also, there is no mandatory internal reporting in the directive, which was there until the very, very, very end of negotiations between Parliament, Commission and Council. Some of the weaker sides then. Um, we did not get advice from trade union. We don't get clearly writings about representation by trade unions. And we have no coverage for workers' rights and anti-discrimination. So what does this boil down to? It boils down to these six challenges in the transposition. First of all, um, the legal basis is both the strength and the weakness of the directive. Make, taking 12 legal bases as they have done uh, with the Treaty of the Functioning European Union and the Euratom Treaty, um, that of course is, uh, is a clever solution uh, so that they can widen the personal scope. Uh, if you would have done this uh, by, by um, putting in place um, something based on 153 in the Treaty of Functional European Union, which is 
uh, workers' rights, uh, then it would have been a much more limited personal scope. So this is the strength. But the weakness is also that it is rather patchy. It uh, is built on this list of different areas. And this uh, makes it, of course, a bit dangerous for the whistleblower. So the communication that comes from the commission is here very important. It is important to go beyond the list in the directive and the annexes. We need to make sure that the national legislations are truly horizontal. And one extremely important part there is to also include the national legislation. It is hard, it is close to impossible for a normal person, which is not a legal scholar, to determine what is in, a, what is in a, an EU directive or a, an EU regulation in the directive. There is a way in the directive to solve this, uh, and that is that the reporting person shall enjoy protection if it has reasonable belief that it falls within the scope of the directive. But as this is about not only being safe, it's also about feeling safe for the whistleblower, then it is important to have as, as low thresholds as possible for reporting. We need to also include, uh, clearly include public interest. And um, this is in reference to breaches in Article 5.1 and Recital 42 in the directive. Uh, this, um, here I could take the example, we, we've talked about France already today, the Sapander legislation, um, which clearly includes public interest. And thanks to the non-regression clause, um, they will not be able to take that away uh, when transposing the directive. So that's important to safeguard. As a minimum though, if we don't get a horizontal application, we need to include working conditions, non-discrimination, occupational health and safety. And, and I'm ha very happy that already several speakers today have mentioned this. Uh, being a trade unionist, of course, it is not always the best way to, to uh, deal with problems in the workplace, um, in, in terms of labor rights to, to blow the whistle. It's better if you can solve it by, by organizing and, and um, having trade union representation and dialogue, social dialogue. But um, we also need to look at ourselves in the mirror from the trade union side. We are not strong everywhere in Europe. And to ensure that also in member states where trade union density is very low, we need to have a good labor uh, protection. So we, we want to include working conditions, non-discrimination and occupational health and safety in the transpositioning of the directive. And finally also include national security. That is clearly out of the scope of EU competence, but here we see that the solution should rather be to have a limited audience and non-regression clause as I did indeed mention. Um, I could mention one example also about why working conditions, non-discrimination, occupational health and safety should really uh, be included. We have heard quite a lot about uh, COVID-19 reports, about personal protective equipment. We had the, the Me Too um, campaign. Uh, so both those two are good example why we need to in in include working conditions and non-discrimination, sexual harassment. Uh, so for an ex as an example, overworked staff in a hospital that can lead to a risk for patients, which is indeed a risk for public health. So there you can safely blow the whistle on the public health, but not on the fact that the staff is overworked. Same, and, and, the, and the example becomes even more absurd if you exchange the hospital or nursing home to a slaughterhouse, because you can also blow the whistle on animal welfare, but not on the health or safety of workers who are overworked and may risk making mistakes when they are killing the animals. Secondly, we need to secure trade union rights. We need to ensure that uh, persons blowing the whistle enjoy protection also when seeking advice from a trade union, to have the right to be represented by trade union. And here the article 3.4 in the directive puts the responsibility on national level 
Most member states, this is probably not a problem, but in some member states, it will be important to look at this in the transposition. Uh, also, the protection for unions carrying the report. So if you, if you turn instead directly to the trade union and disclose, um, there, the directive doesn't really address what a trade union is. We are, also, we are, of course, not an internal reporting recipient. We are also not an external reporting recipient. So that only leaves the third option. And we can't see that going to the trade union should be the same as a public disclosure. There is a difference if you put something on Facebook or you talk to the trade union about something. Uh, facilitators who are protected by the directive are natural persons. So therefore, uh, trade unions are not in the scope of that. Thirdly, we need to protect reports also to line manager and HR. The directive requires that we set up reporting channels also internally. And here, of course, the aim is to get more report by protecting reporting persons. So then we need to ensure that we don't cover only the reporting channel, but also to human rights, uh, sorry, not human rights, human resources, or to the line manager. And uh, example was mentioned here before, also duty speech uh, reports, which are obliged to be made in the, in the line of work. Uh, I could take France here again as an example, which today protects disclosure to a line manager. And I would again there point to a non-regression clause. So I hope that France in, in the new application continues to, to protect also uh, line manager reports. Fourth, access to documents. Um, so the directive talks about uh, member states, leaving up to member states to define criminal liability when it comes to uh, how the documents were acquired that are leaked. I think it's safe to say that accessing that document is a very necessary part of the reporting. If you don't have access to the document, then what have you to disclose? So uh, here it is crucial that we uh, see to that in the national transposition of the directive, we don't get uh, too far-reaching criminal liability when it comes to the disclosure of documents. It must be a necessary part of the reporting. It should therefore also be protected. Fifth, definition of reasonable belief. So there are a couple of instances in the directive, and in particular, the one I mentioned about the, the areas covered by the directive. So if one reasonably, reasonably believes that it falls within the scope of the directive, then you should enjoy protection. And here the directive does not uh, give a definition of reasonable belief. The normal legal standard is that when others with equivalent knowledge, training and experience could agree. This should indeed be included. Sixth. So the employer's burden of proof um, when it, um, uh, and this, the, here we have two different writings in the directive and we need to read the recital to understand the article. So here the important task is to ensure that member states don't only look at the article when transposing the directive. So the, the recital is uh, more clear. It says that when, when the bonus proofs has shifted to the employer, then it is up to the employer to demonstrate that the action taken was not linked in any way to the reporting or the public disclosure. This is much tougher for the employer to do rather than the uh, writing in the article where the employer only has to prove that that measure was based on duly justified grounds. Uh, duly justified grounds that, that could be up to the employer to, to decide what that could be. It could be that, well, he was, he was late that Tuesday morning. And what, why could the court then argue with that? And finally, one more thing, because this was already six. The law is only a start. Uh, we need a culture change, both in private and public sector. And this directive can indeed be the start of this, especially in those member states where there has been zero um, protection before the directive. For the public sector, this is about holding power to account. 
And uh, therefore, it is also important to have in mind concerns about rule of law and independent judiciary when it concerns the implementation of the directive. Uh, and uh, the, doing this culture change also in the public sector. As we are a little bit behind schedule, I will finish there and I uh, leave you with my contact details, uh, my email, if you would like to seek contact with us. I can also recommend you to look up whistleblowerprotection.eu, where we have some, now not updated in a while, but we have quite a lot of uh, resources that we link to there also. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, Mr. Jefflin, uh, for this very inspiring and motivational uh, speech. And when you were talking about uh, weak trade, un trade unions and weak social dialogue, uh, I'm sure you know you were exactly speaking ab about our countries, the Visegrad countries. So your message is very important for us, I believe. And it was also very good to have this uh, more holistic, horizontal background information against our particular national uh, thinking. So thanks again for this speech. Uh, we immediately uh, join to the next speaker, who is uh, Beata Baran. Uh, she's an attorney at law, and she's also an assistant professor at the Law and Administration Faculty of the Jagalonian University. She's a specialist in the field of compliance, whistleblowing, and internal investigation in practice also. So we are very much looking forward to hear your, hearing your perspectives. I already see the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. First, of, first and foremost, thank you very much for uh, an invitation to such an important debate. It's my pleasure and honor uh, to be able to give uh, a talk, a speech during today's webinar. The aim of my presentation is to conduct an assessment uh, of a bill on the protection of uh, whistleblowers. Uh, which is uh, available to the public. The bill was written by the Polish NGOs, uh, which were led by the Battery Foundation, the Polish branch of Transparency International, and in cooperation with other NGOs, the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, Trade Union Forum, and the Institute of Public Affairs. In terms of compliance with the new EU Directive on Whistleblower Protections. In the following presentation, I will also address the issue of proposed criminal law norms, uh, which are in the bill, and which are a response to the violation of whistleblowers protection, as well as improper inter-organizational implementation of the whistleblowing procedure. The fundamental question is, uh, fundamental question which could uh, to be raised at the beginning is why the NGO's bill should be analyzed. Mm, the answer is simple. Uh, firstly, there is lack of an official governmental bill yet, which would transport the, transpose the directive into the national legal system of Poland. Secondly, the widely distributed proposal of the NGOs could be and most probably will be a benchmark for any other bill. Then it's officially presented to the government by authors and it also Mm, when it was brought into the daylight uh, for the first time in 2017, since then the public consultation were put on hold. And for today's presentation, I will refer to the version of the bill available on the foundation uh, website. The subject of today's analysis uh, will be the following aspects of compliance of Polish NGOs bill with the directive. Firstly, subjective and then material scope. Then it will be followed by procedure aspect and temporal aspects. And the final part will concern the criminal law and the proposed legislative solution in this matter. So let's have a look on the uh, personal scope. Firstly, it concerns who the whistleblower is due to the bill uh, regulation. The bill's authors uh, defined whistleblower as a person who reports in connection with performed duties, performed work, or perform contract reports irregularities in accordance with the given act or helps in reporting the irregularities, especially by information delivery on them. 
The analyzed bills bill does, uh, does not limit the reported issue to work-related context. Moreover, it enables to protect whistleblowing in any contractual context, and it, as it is stated in Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the bill, from named contracts like for example, residential tenancy agreement to unnamed contracts. This solution can be assessed positively, having in mind that in accordance to the directive and following its national acts, the subject of reported irregularities fall within the scope of the union acts set out in the directive annex and given areas like transport safety or public health. On the other side, in the next paragraph of Article 2 of the bill, paragraph 2, it is underlined that regardless of the type of the legal bond between a whistleblower and an employing entity, it is enough for being protected as long as the reported breach is connected with the employing entity. It can be assessed as a kind of inconsistency because in one case, any breaches can be reported, also including those connected with uh, work-related context, but not limited to it. And on the other side, the employment relationship is exposed as a mandatory prerequisite to be a whistleblower. The directive states that the status of whistleblower can be also assigned to a reporting person before he or she is employed. The Lega Ferenda I proposed to cover by the whistleblower's bills protection also persons who report events occurring in the pre-contractual stage, like a job candidate. A kind of drawback in the Polish NGO's bill uh, is a lack of uh, granting whistleblower status to legal entities belonging or connected in a work-related context to whistleblowers, uh, which are covered by, uh, which are not covered by the Polish bill. This disadvantage can be justified uh, due to the timing of the bill preparation, which preceded implementation of these two specific categories uh, into the directive definition of reporting person. When we uh, switched to the uh, material uh, scope, uh, the subjective scope, the analyzing uh, of it, um, of this aspect, and also the proposed definition of employer should be brought to the light. Uh, firstly, it is worth underlining that the bill's definition is broader than the one which is stated in the Polish Labor Code, and it includes also the principal and the party ordering the project regarding the project contractor, and the person managing a unit of the public finance sector. The problem which arises here is the one who has the status of subject for which the work or service is provided, an unnamed contract under which a whistleblowing report also can be delivered due to the provision of the bill. Delegate Ferenda, I propose to change the wording of the definition to more flexible one, which follows the directive guidelines and put emphasis on the legal entities in the private and public sector without exhaustive enumeration of types of those entities for whom the work is performed. Secondly, what should be clearly underlined is the fact that the evaluated legislative materials uh, covers in the scope of irregularities any breach of law regarding threatening public interest, as well as any breaches of internal regulation, including a code of conducts or good practices collection. In my opinion, it might be worth considering and reaching the definition by omissions and or inactions. In my opinion, a solution which should be made with approval uh, is the inclusion within the scope of the analyzed norms, both reporting events that have already taken place or are, or are ongoing, as well as those for which there is only a suspicion of occurrence. This approach is also in line with the EU directive. Also, the prerequisite of acting in a good faith by a whistleblower is in vain with the, e the new EU directive. Taking into consideration the subjective scope, it is necessary to have a look into the whistleblower's protection measures and the approach to this issue in the Polish NGO's proposal. Work of approval is the starting point of reporting person protection, which is stated from the moment of delivering the report. The protection is enforced regardless of confirmation of the truthfulness of the provided information. Analyzing the protection aspect, I feel obliged to bring to the light the lack of proposal of specific norms concerning uh, measures of protections of person concerned. Uh, mentioned in the directive, the right to fair trial, the presumption of innocence, the right to access to files and the right to be heard are basic parts of the Polish criminal law and criminal procedure. No specific solution regarding protection of persons concerned in a in a report are proposed in the Polish bill. Uh, 
Nevertheless, then can be considered some kind of um, extended protection measure, measures such as, for example, easier access to free legal aid. Uh, going further to the uh, procedural uh, aspect, let's have a look at the uh, proposal presented by the Polish NGOs bill. Firstly, what should be met with acceptance is the proposed structure or design of reporting channels, which consist of both internal and external ones. The proposal established uh, the scheme of reporting as follows. Before making a public disclosure, a whistleblower should firstly report the irregularities via the internal, intra-organizational channel or external reporting channel to competent authorities. The bill creates an alternative for internal reporting, which is reporting to a competent authority. Uh, analyzing the bill, uh, we find that the bill does not specify which body or bodies are competent in the matter of receiving external reports. Moreover, authors of the bill suggest establishing a new public authority uh, committee for the whistleblower's protection. The new entity consists of the ombudsman, government representatives, employee representatives, employers representatives, and community, community organizations and NGOs. The committee uh, has uh, as a main competence verification of the work of bodies competent in receiving external reports. Consequently, there is an objective legal loophole. The bill does not indicate who is responsible for receiving the external reports. Simultaneously, it states who is responsible for monitoring activities of those unknown but competent bodies. Another pertinent point is that the Polish proposal allows anonymous external report, reports. As to my mind, this aspect should be elucidated, especially regarding vastly general reports from which it is not possible to extract information about irregularities, when and how an irregularity occurred. The issue regarding the internal reporting channel implementation, which should be underlined here, is the proposal of consultation of the content of whistleblowing procedure with trade unions or employee representatives. It is in line with the provision of cooperation with social partners. Polish bill takes a step further and in private sector entities allows a as a report receiving subject uh, or design um, uh, and appoint a special person dedicated to this activity or a trade union to be responsible for receiving whistleblowing reports. The second solution, to my mind, could not fully meet the prerequisite of impartiality when receiving and following up reports. The social partners can be involved in appointing the receiving report person in the organization. A more specific example tackles the case of units of the public finance sector, which can be simplified as a public sector. In the internal whistleblowing procedures foreseen for them, there is an obligation to inform the reporting person about the outcome of the internal investigation. I found this solution as a good example of implementing the directive provisions, and it should be extended also for the private sector entities. What is worth mentioning here is also the obligation of reviewing the whistleblowing procedures of the public uh, finance uh, sector units by the National Supreme Audit Office. The solution creates external supervision over the correctness of the implemented intra-organizational procedures, which should be met with approval. Another pertinent point is the temporal aspects of the analyzed legal norms. One example is the obligation of acknowledgement of receipt of the report to the reporting person with, within seven days. It is not foreseen in the analyzed bill. I suggest the Lega Ferenda to complement the project in this aspect. The next problem is the time limit included in the Polish regulation regarding a reasonable time frame to provide feedback of the report to a whistleblower. The EU regulation states that the deadline should not exceed three months from the acknowledgement of receipt or if no acknowledgement was sent to the reporting person, three months from the expiry of the seven days period after the report was made. The NGO's bill states that within 21 days from the receiving of the report, it should be considered. What Polish authors means as a consideration, it is at least, in, in, at least initiation of the proceedings. A general consideration at this point is that the Polish proposal is stricter and in the same time more pro-whistleblower than the EU regulation, which should be made with approval. The last issue I tackled during my presentation is connected with proposal of 
criminal sanctions included in the bill. They are connected with different aspects, starting from retaliation actions against a reporting person, through disclosure of whistleblower's personal data and criminal liability of a person managing a unit of the public finance sector responsible for implementing internal whistleblowing procedure to knowingly reporting false information. What is also important is introducing into the legal system a clause excluding the whistleblower's criminal liability for certain prohibited acts that may be committed as a part of reporting or public disclosure. To this category can be included disclosures or make use of information he, she has learned in relation to a function or work he, she has performed or a public social business or scientific activity she ha has conducted. The same situation arises with crime of defamation and false accusation. The issue that stands out in terms of criminal sanction is relatively low subject to penalties in context of committed prohibited acts. Penalties which are foreseen in the Andrews bills are, for example, fines or the penalty of deprivation of liberty for retaliation actions against a whistleblower. In such a circumstances arise a problem whether such low threats of penalty fulfill the obligation imposed by the directive to implement effective proportionate and dissuasive anti-retaliation actions. Another interesting point to consider due to the presented bill regulation uh, is the fact that it's not clear whether the prohibited acts are crimes or controversions because of the unclear penalty threat. Due to the Polish uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence, it can be assessed that the aforementioned criminal offenses are rather misdemeanors, a type of a less serious crimes. Unfortunately, it was not possible to cover all relevant issues regarding the analyzed norm uh, due to the time limit. Today's presentation aim was to familiarize, familiarize distinguished audience with the issue of compliance of the only one proposal of legal regulations focused on whistleblowers in Poland legal universe without the, uh, with the EU directive. An accurate summary of the current state of art are words of Barack Obama. We have to acknowledge the progress we made, but understand that we will still have a long way to go. The things are better, but still not good enough. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this comprehensive and very interesting presentation about this draft, about this bill. And as you said, we have a long way to go <laughs> with the implementation in our countries, but we don't have such a long way to go with the conference. Uh, we uh, are coming to our last uh, speaker. Uh, she's uh, Zuzanna Grochalova. Uh, I'm sorry uh, for my pronunciation if it's not uh, correct. Uh, Susanna is coming from the non-profit sector. Uh, she's currently working for the Transparency International Slovakia, and she's a coordinator for whistleblowing projects. So I am very happy to have another perspective, uh, apart from governmental agencies, uh, public bodies, trade unions, and so on. We also have here the NGO sector. So please, Susanna, the floor is yours. Susanna, are you here? I'm sorry to in, uh, to interrupt. I have a question. Sorry, we cannot hear you. At least I cannot hear you. Okay, is it better now? Is it better now? Do you hear? Yeah, me? yeah. Now it's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I am contact with. I'm uh, in contact with Zana, uh, but she told me that she was traveling, but she is three hours late. Yeah, so she won't be able to participate. Oh, it's a pity. Sorry, we, we didn't know that. And thank you for the information. Um, of course, it's a pity, but uh, we are already behind schedule on the other hand. Uh, so please, dear colleagues, and uh, especially the audience, uh, if you have questions or comments, please uh, feel free to still use the chat box. Uh, or raise your hand uh, virtually and uh, we have some room for discussion. Uh, currently, I don't see any written uh, question in the chat box or in the question and answer box. Um, so if you have any, please uh, do it now or ask it now. Uh, 
anyway, I have one question from Dagmara, uh, because uh, as far as I know, our conference is also broadcasted on the YouTube channel and uh, someone was asking a question from the YouTube channel and uh, please Dagmara, uh, I give you the floor to ask this question. And if there are no other questions, maybe I would have a small question, but it's not very important. So please first Dagmara. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Attila. Uh, in fact, uh, we have viewers on our streaming media and one question uh, has arrived from, from the YouTube uh, um, viewer, a person um, who is Vice President of Fund for Protection of Environment in Łódź, uh, Dr. Anna Gurczyńska. I think this is a specialized question which uh, is certainly um, foremost uh, addressed to representatives of, uh, of government, but if any other persons would like to, to react, uh, that would be fine. So I'm, I'm reading uh, the question. How do you see the role of whistleblowers for the assurance of public funds expenditures in the national programs? Could whistleblowers help, for example, tax offices to discover frauds to what extent, this is certainly for, for um, persons who collect data, to what extent do you collect any data in your countries in this aspect? Thank you. So I ask the members of the panel, please feel free to answer. Just uh, unmute your mic and uh, feel free to reflect on the question if you have any reflection. Any one of you, Johanna, Peter, Martin, Susanna, Beata, if you have any comment. Yeah, I see Johanna maybe. Yeah, I, if I may, uh, I think that whistleblowers can be very helpful even in this area. And I think that uh, financial sector, even the directive presumes that in the financial sector, the whistleblowers will be very helpful and will be blowing the whistle. But there are certain limitations, especially in the sector, and uh, we have to we have to respect the special ways of uh, whistleblowing uh, regarding the secrets and trade secrets, etc. Thank you very much. Maybe someone else. I don't see anyone. Maybe I would join with a small question if you have any reflection on this. Uh, I would be very interested in uh, the question that, uh, in your opinion, what would be the ideal or maybe not ideal, but at least the realistic uh, model for social consultation connected to the implementation of the directive? I ask this questions, question because, uh, in my view, whistleblowing is connected to so many uh, fields of law, criminal law, labor law, anti-discrimination, anti-corruption, and so on. So it's very difficult to organize uh, effective lawmaking and effective social consultation. And also, as we saw in the afternoon panel, many stakeholders are involved, trade unions, uh, NGOs, and so on. So do you have any experience maybe on the national level, or maybe Martin, especially on the European level? So what is the ideal and realistic uh, setting of social consultation uh, connected to this topic? Uh, that would be my question. I, I would see Martin, yeah, thank you. There. Well, first of all, let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can yeah. hear you, but cannot see you, but... Can hear me, not see me. That's fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Experience some technical difficulties. Well, at least you hear me. Yeah. So, um, the, the directive does indeed speak about um, social partners' involvement. I, I think it says where appropriate or something like that. And of course, being a social partner myself, I, I do think it's, a, it's appropriate everywhere. Social di dialogue needs to be strengthened in all member states. And that is also something that has been on the Commission's agenda for quite some time. Um, and this would be a good opportunity. Those who know the sectors are, of course, the, the social partners in the sector. So, so it's also important as, as when it comes to the implementation of the um, 
and the reporting channels requirements also uh, to ensure that social partners are, are doing their job and setting up these channels in a way that works uh, with the industry sector in, in, uh, in the country. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the meantime, we have uh, an additional question in the chat box. If you can take a look at it, especially uh, Johanna and maybe uh, Zuzanna Baksha from Hungary also, because the question uh, goes like this. Uh, I would like to uh, read only the most important part. Sorry for that. Uh, the question goes to Johanna, especially. Uh, in your point of view, how would be ensured the independency of the anti-corruption department when it is hierarchically directly under the control of the head of the Minister of Justice? It's a good question. And another part of the question, uh, what are the main arguments against the Ombudsman as the external reporting body uh, in the Czech Republic? And maybe it's also relevant for my country, for Hungary, because in Hungary we have the Ombudsman as the uh, main external reporting body. So please, Johanna, and if you want, Zuzanna, uh, would be happy to hear your reflections. Uh, okay, so if I may answer the question, we discussed it even with Mrs. Blahova before, and you cannot simply uh, expect or a priori assume that the officials from the Ministry of Justice uh, wouldn't be independent while securing this agenda. There is also the very clear polit political uh, political um, process uh, in case that uh, the uh, work of Ministry of Justice isn't uh, isn't working quite good. So the Ministry of Justice is responsible for the agenda, and that is very clear. And it is really easy or possible to revoke Minister of Justice on uh, on the basis of uh, the protection of whistleblowers not working very well. As for the second part of the question, maybe it's it's a question for someone who is working for Ombudsman Office, rather. But I think uh, at this moment uh, the office uh, hasn't got the personal and material resources to uh, to secure this agenda. And uh, Johanna, if you are here, sorry, maybe do you have experience with the social consultation with my question? So what was the experience in the Czech Republic or, or how did it happen? Uh, do you mean in general or, or in general? Yeah, 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 in general. Yeah, it was a really very lengthy and thorough and in-depth uh, discussion. We really uh, wanted to find a common ground uh, to hear out the NGOs and other interested parties. And we really trying to find out the best way how to incorporate uh, the directive. And I hope we somehow manage that, but we will see in practice. I can presume how this will work in practice now. And yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. we are still awaiting the governmental process and the uh, working committees of the legislative uh, government uh, uh, committee. So um, the draft as is now can very well change in the upcoming week. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the panel would like to say anything? Yeah, I see Martin maybe. Yeah. Yes, I can come in again about the social consultation as you as you did indeed. Uh, now it seems the camera is working again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you did ask also ask before uh, about the European level, and um, as as I mentioned in my my intervention, and several speakers have mentioned also today, working conditions, occupational health and safety, and non discrimination is not part of this directive. It's not in this long list of twelve legal bases. And uh, my assumption is that one of the main reason, if not perhaps the only reason, is that when the Commission puts that in there, they are also required to consult with the social partners. This was under uh, a bit of a time, um, time stress <laughs> to get it done before the end of the previous uh, Commission. Uh, so by, by leaving those um, 
those articles in the treaty which require social partner consultation out of the scope of the directive, uh, the commission view is that they didn't need to consult the social partners. Because usually on the European level, when, when there is legislation proposed uh, in the social policy field, they first need to go to the social partners and ask, are you willing to negotiate? And that it's first up to us to, to take around with the employers and see if we can hash out uh, a proposal to, to give to the commission in this. Um, unfortunately, we did, not, we did not do this process, uh, so we did not get to hear the, the business side either. But uh, the trade unions, at least, we, we managed to get our voices heard in the process, even though we didn't get it fully our way. Thanks a lot. Uh, as I see, there are no other reflections and questions. Uh, so I have no other role than to thank you again, especially uh, the speakers and also the audience. And if I took a look uh, uh, at the audience, the list of the audience, I saw many very interesting uh, participants. For example, we had uh, uh, a participant even from Australia uh, who was responsible for drafting uh, a whistleblow whistleblowing law in Australia. Uh, and we have many uh, bosses of governmental agencies among the audiences. So it was a pleasure to have you all here. And uh, thank you again. It was a long but very fruitful day. And I think uh, that we are much more well prepared for our project uh, as uh, scientists, as academics. And uh, I hope that also the practical implementation of the directive in the Visegrad countries can benefit from these discussions. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, I would like to give back the floor to Dagmara, the main organizer who would like to uh, close the conference. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Attila. Before closing the conference, uh, I would like to uh, shortly um, respond to the question which was addressed uh, personally to me uh, from Mrs. Alicia Diakiewicz, um, who was interested to ask about the activity of whistleblowers' uh, disclosures during the current COVID-19 pandemic in Poland and the role they can play in uncovering the misappropriation of COVID relief funds. So uh, thank you for this question, because actually these turbulent times of COVID-19 uh, even make, made it more visible how important is the role of whistleblowers. There were cases of whistleblowers um, publicly disclosing, disclosing um, different problems, deficiencies um, with uh, healthcare. Uh, system sanitizing regimes. As it concerns the um, second part of the question, I wouldn't say that a big distinction should be made uh, in reference to the role of whistleblowers um, in uncovering the misappropriation of COVID relief funds. I would say that here applies our citizens' duty to um, inform about any criminal offenses that we observe in our uh, surrounding and of course, it's um, also the task of appropriate offices to um, control the, the use of, uh, of these funds. So let me now um, thank you for your participation, for sharing with us your knowledge, your professional experience. Thank you for the enriching uh, debate. Last but not least, I would like to thank our great uh, interpreters who really have a difficult task uh, to uh, translate for us uh, in such innovative uh, conditions. But I think that everything uh, went really very well with uh, translations. Anyway, before closing officially our conference, I would like to kindly ask you to spare a small moment and uh, to respond to our fully anonymous survey that should be soon visible on our screen. So if I may ask to put in the survey. Yes, uh, 
Please kindly let me know on chat if it uh, should be translated into Visegrad countries languages or we may go only with English version. No, uh, no signal, so please kindly, uh, if you may, respond. For my part, thank you so much once again for joining us today. And I have a pleasure to invite you to our second event, which is uh, scheduled for the 15th June 2021 in Prague. And hopefully it will be already in the real life. Thank you. Unfortunately, there is no reception, but maybe in June. <laughs> Looking forward to, to meeting you in person. So, I think the final closure is now. Thank you. Goodbye. We are ending the conference.